I don't know you do believe in the idea of multidisciplinary thinking which is a great thing in one of the few places uh, where they have special special courses where you could look do combine majors and you know different uh, fields or different from different disciplines um i am going to focus on something else i'm going to focus on a discipline which is mathematics you know we all studied but i'm going to keep it really simple in the sense that i'm going to talk to you about um the title which is the practical utility of eight sorry mistake it was eight when i started thinking about it then it became seven so i want to change that seven is the correct number okay so i'm going to talk about the practical utility the reason why i talk about is i'm you know basically that these are things that there is nothing that i'm going to talk about the concept itself the concept that i talk about that you don't already know you know it you studied it school maybe here but you studied it and um you will see when i speak about each one of them um the problem i'm trying to address is this that modern education system is very good at teaching important concepts that really matter but uh, and many of these concepts are taught very early um as you will see but no one teaches you how to use these powerful ideas later in life i mean that's something that you have to figure out on your own and over time people tend to forget about the power of these ideas today i'll remind you of some of those ideas that you have been taught which you already know but you may not know just how powerful they are how important they are and how i use them routinely in my work and of course it can be used in every profession i'm going to talk about my profession investment management how i uh, use these ideas routinely and um, the, the 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 basic point is that these ideas help you if you use them well make you a better thinker and in any profession when you are competing against people whose job is also to outthink you uh, you get a competitive advantage you get a competitive advantage if you are able to think better than others and that has obviously vast practical consequences money for example uh <clears throat> all of these ideas from one discipline as i mentioned math there are seven of them let's just start diving in you would have done this long time back and i think you'll remember idea number 1 it's called prove by contradiction what does this mean it's not new it's nothing new you learned it in school and the first time i think you encountered this is when you were asked to prove that the square root of 2 is an irrational number you remember that you remember you know working out the square root if you don't remember this is the way to do it and don't worry about it you don't have to uh, derive it again but there is a method that you were taught when you were taught how to cal- how to prove that the square root of 2 is an irrational number you prove that by first assuming it to be a rational number and then showing that if it was a rational number it will lead to some kind of an absurd outcome and absurd outcomes don't happen therefore your original assumption that it was a rational number must be wrong right you learned this in school and then you sort of forget about the whole thing you know square root of 2 irrational number been there done that it's over but it's a mental trick that i think is incredibly useful in many fields especially in the field that i work in and i will give you example of some of the smartest people i know in the in this field who use it routinely you know for them it's like a trick they have learned in school and you know they use it routinely and i tell you how they use it because i'm going to talk about an idea you learned in school and six other ideas and how you use them routinely in your daily work now let's imagine that um you believe you come to the conclusion that there is something really wrong going on you're studying something and i'll give you examples there is something very wrong going on but nobody agrees with you you know there's some you can see something there's something going wrong and nobody believes you so what do you do you use proof by contradiction you say okay let's assume that what is going on is not wrong it's okay everything is okay right um then what does it mean what does it mean what could it lead to just like in the proof of proof by contradiction what does it lead us to if nothing is wrong here then this must happen and if that if you can show to people that that thing happening or or the happening of that thing is not going to happen it's impossible it's an absurd thing then you have basically proved that what is going on is really really wrong so let's talk about that 
I mean, there is a Latin way of describing it, it's called reductio ad absurdum, which means that, but it is absurd. The outcome is absurd, so the assumption must be wrong. It's a form of argument that attempts to disprove a statement by showing it that it inevitably leads to a ridiculous, absurd, or an impractical conclusion. So let's talk about my field. I'll give you an example of from the best teacher in the field, Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett was one of the investors who didn't get into the dot-com you know, euphoria. There was a huge bubble in 1997, 98, 99. There were like crazy multiples being assigned to companies. And multiples actually infinite because the denominator was zero. There were no earnings. So uh, these companies were, you know, had no substance and they were like new startup ventures. They were being valued in the market like two billion, three billion, four billion dollars. And he didn't participate in what was going on. Then in 2000, uh, AGM, March, he was, you know, questioned by a lot of, uh, there were a lot of media articles, by the way, which said that this guy has lost it, he's an old guy, he doesn't know, this is a new world. Um, and he felt that there was something terribly wrong going on. He was basically saying there's a huge asset price bubble going on in the dot-com industry. And he gave a talk. In 2000, he gave a talk. He was asked by Berkshire Hathaway shareholders to explain why he did not buy any internet stock. And uh, so he says, well, he obviously knew that there was something terribly wrong with the valuations of the overall um, internet uh, businesses out there. He used the trick, the same trick that you learned in school, the same trick that we are talking about right now, which is called the proof by contradiction. He wanted to use it to demonstrate the silliness of the market at the time. Here is what he said. I'm going to read from his, the transcript of his talk. He said, when we buy a stock, we always think in terms of buying the whole business because it enables us to think like businessmen. So let's just take a company that has marvelous prospects and that's paying you nothing right now, but the current market value is 500 billion. So it doesn't pay you any dividends. There are no you know, um, cash inflows that are occurring to you. It has a market cap of $500 billion, which is a big number in 2000. It's still a big number. It was a very big number. Much, you know, uh, there were hardly any companies of that valuation at the time. I suspect he was referring to Yahoo. He didn't name Yahoo, but he was referring to Yahoo. And he said, you're a businessman. Let's imagine that you're a businessman. You buy, and, you know, you buy the whole business for $500 billion. Imagine you have all the money in the world and you can buy this company, Yahoo, let's say, for $500 billion. But people who buy assets, they buy it in the expectation of earning something from those assets. So let's put a number to that. He said, let's just put a normal number, 10%. So if you think 10% is the appropriate return and it pays you nothing this year, but starts to pay you next year. So you say, okay, they don't, and it's okay to put money in investment projects that don't pay you anything right now. And they pay you much more later on, DCF. <coughs> so you're getting compensated for the weight. He said, okay. Yahoo doesn't make any money right now, or whichever company he was talking to. He didn't actually use Yahoo uh, as an example. He didn't name the company. But he says, well, if it doesn't pay you anything right now, but starts paying you next year, then it must compensate you for the weight. So if, if the value is 50 billion, you should have been paid uh, 50 billion. You were not. So next year, you should be paid interest on interest for the weight. 55 billion each year in perpetuity. But if it is not going to pay you anything in the, under the next three years, then it has to be 60.5 billion each year, again in perpetuity, to justify the present price. And he said then, I question sometimes that the people who are paying 500 billion implicitly for a business by paying up some price for 100 shares of stock are really thinking about the mathematics that is implicit in what they are doing. For example, let's just assume that there's going to be a one year delay before the business starts paying out and you want to get a 10% return. If you paid 500 billion, then 55 billion in, uh, in, in cash is the amount that it has to pay you year after year after year. Now that's what is coming to you. But to do that, they have to pay taxes on that earnings, right? So what is the pre-tax? He now moves up. So we're moving from profit after taxes to up. He moves to pre-tax earnings. To do that, it has to make about 80 billion. And then he stops. And I'll give you more example where you don't have to stop. You can go all the way up to revenue and this is the point we ha uh, uh, on that. Um, I'll come to that in a, in a bit. He says, look around the universe of businesses in this world and see how many of earning 80 billion pre-tax or 70 or 60 or 50 or 50 or 40 or even 30. You won't find any. 
So he says that the people who are paying, you know, they are buying 100 shares and they are buying 50 shares and reading of reports and media uh, stories that internet is going to change everything and the old rules of valuation do no longer apply and this is a crazy bubble and I don't want to, I can only punch, I cannot puncture it but I can only um, explain uh, to you by using a very simple idea that this is absurd, that no, no company makes that kind of money. The kind of money that you need to earn to justify this valuation is not going to happen. If it's not going to happen, then the current valuation must be wrong. And in the next three years, Yahoo's valuation dropped by about 85 to 90%. Every dot-com company went down by that much. Some of them went down by 100%. They went basically broke. So it's uh, important to recognize that the trick, the method, the, the logic that he followed was based out of something everybody knows, you know. It's not something that is... You know, he's a smart guy and he's very rich, so you think that he's a genius or something. But he used elementary common sense, which in this case was derived from a very simple mathematical principle. Ralph Fanger is a, was a, he's a retired guy now, he's a very famous uh, fund manager. And um, I used to get his letters and he used to write very entertaining letters uh, about his, the way he thinks about investing. And he one, in one of the letters he spoke about and I cite this as an example to my main course uh, at, at MDI uh, about the disk drive industry. Like this is 1980s, you know, disk drives were invented and it was a hot sector and everybody wanted to jump into that sector. And there are a lot of these companies that had entered into the space and he said, he used the same methodology and there was a kind of a bubble on hard drive companies because this was thought that people are running out of space and computers have floppy disks and floppy disks will be replaced by hard drives and hard drives... Uh, will um, you know become uh, more and more important and the price will come down, they will become more affordable, more and more people will buy it and hard drive will become uh, something that you can't do without. And therefore there is going to be growth. The growth in demand will come from the fact that it's going to become, it's, it, it totally disrupts the floppy disk market, it's a better product, it will become cheaper over time, it can store a lot more information, it's very quick, uh, you can retrieve data far much faster and so on and on and on. He writes in the letter the following words. Remember back in the 80s, now notice for a moment the hard drive manufacturing industry, if you think about it, would be a very capital intensive industry. You have to spend a lot of money building a plant. You know, you also know that the way technology works, these things tend to get obsoleted rather quickly. So um, you have a cutting edge technology which helps you make the fastest and the biggest hard drive in the world which in 1980s or something like to the order of 40 megabyte and somebody else comes up with a technology to make a 80 megabyte or 100 megabyte uh, hard drive which is even faster and cheaper then what happens to your plant you have to spend more money to build up a new plant and all that so it's a it's a very capital intensive industry which requires enormous amounts of spend on um, research and development and, and, and basically research and product development and therefore, um, it's an industry where you need a minimum amount of size to be profitable because a, lo a lot of costs are upfront costs. You know, you have to spend money on, on research and development, uh, you have to spend money on sales and marketing, you have to build a brand. And therefore, in order to be profitable in an industry, you need a certain size. So this is what he says. Remember back in 80s, when the hard drive for computers were in was invented, it was an important, crucial invention. And the investors were eager to be part of this technology. More than 70 disk drive companies were formed and their stocks were sold to the public. Each company had to get at least 20% of the market to survive. For some reason, they didn't all do it. You know, if you have 70 companies, we know mathematically it is impossible for each one of them to have at least a 20% market share. And he stopped over there, but he's basically making a very simple logical point. That knowing what you know about this economics of this industry. There's space for maximum five players. There are 70 players and 70 players, each one of them thinks that they will be among the five players. And each of the investors in all of them, so it's like saying five out of these 70 companies are going to survive at most, maybe two or three. So the, the mortality rate of this industry is going to be very high. It's like picking out needle in, out of a haystack. Which one is going to survive? Which one is not going to survive? You can't tell. You can't even say, well, this is the best product that will survive because technology shows you that the guy with the best product is not necessarily the guy who survives. You know? 
we know that so it is extremely speculative he zoomed out he didn't focus on the prospects of this one company or two or three companies he looked at the aggregate capitalization aggregate market value of the overall uh, industry he looked at um, the number of players he looked at how many uh, uh, what is the minimum um, market share that is required to get to the point where you start making some money and uh, he said well that's not going to happen you know there aren't you know there are too many players here most of them are going to bro go broke and that's exactly what happened in the next 6 or 7 or 8 years most of those companies went belly up the ones that survive you know seagate and there are like three or four other names which are still around they have remained in business but most people who entered the industry are no longer there now you can see the practical utility here that he he basically he was saying why am i not going into that industry why am i not putting your money my client is writing to his client why am i not risking your capital by putting money in that industry because he thinks it's like picking the needle out of a haystack and i don't have a skill nobody knows nobody knows which one of those 70 companies will turn out to be one of the five or four or three that are going to be around and if you don't know then you're basically speculating example 3 same point harry marco polo is a greek guy he became very famous because he um he ruined the life of a guy called bernie madoff bernie madoff was a fraudster bernie madoff madoff conducted a 50 billion dollar fraud many years ago um and this guy uh uh you know um exposed bernie madoff by doing some mathematical calculations you know i'll, I'll just let him explain how he came to those conclusions by playing a couple of videos it's been two and a half months since bernard l madoff was picked up and charged with what's believed to be the largest financial fraud in history yet we still don't know much more about the alleged 50 billion dollar scam than what madoff initially told the fbi agents who arrested him There are still no indictments as federal prosecutors continue to unravel the case and to try and figure out exactly what happened and who all was involved. But the proof that it happened can be found in the ruined lives of thousands of victims. The one person who knows the most and is willing to talk is Harry Markopolis, the man who figured out Madoff's scheme before anyone else. He sat down with us for his only television interview. Until a few months ago, Harry Markopolis was an obscure financial analyst and mildly eccentric fraud investigator from Boston, who most people would never notice on the street. My modern Greek hero, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> But today he enjoys an almost heroic status, pursued by journalists and movie producers and honored by colleagues as the man who went to the Securities and Exchange Commission and blew the whistle on Bernie Madoff in his 50 billion dollar fraud. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please take your seats. But he seems uncomfortable with all the attention and knows that he is no hero. Uh, I stand before you a 50 billion dollar failure. Uh, <laughs> How many times did you send material to the SEC? May 2000, October 2001, October, November and December 2005, then again June 2007, and finally April 2008. So five separate SEC submissions. And in spite of all of the things that you did, it still ended up in disaster. There's nothing to be proud about in this case. I feel horrible about the result. It's been a total disaster for the victims. It began a decade ago when Marco Polis was working for a Boston investment firm. His boss told him that Bernard Madoff, a former chairman of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange, was running a huge unregistered hedge fund that was producing incredible returns. He wanted Harry to reverse engineer its trading strategy and revenue streams so that the firm could duplicate Madoff's results. He had the patina of being a respected citizen, one of the most successful businessmen in New York and certainly one of the most powerful men on Wall Street. You would never suspect him of fraud unless you knew the math. So, I mean, you're like a math guy, right? I've taken all the calculus courses from integral calculus to differential calculus, as well as linear algebra and statistics, both normal and non-normal. How long did it take you to figure out that there was something wrong? It took me five minutes to know that 
it was a fraud. It took me another almost four hours of mathematical modeling to prove that it was a fraud. What were the things that caught your attention? It was the performance line. As we know, the markets go up and down. And his only went up. He had very few down months. Only 4% of the months were down months. And that would be equivalent to a baseball player in the major leagues betting 960 for a year. Clearly impossible. You would suspect cheating immediately. Maybe he was just good. No one's that good. Harry said there were only two plausible explanations. Either Madoff was using insider information to rack up huge profits, or he was running a giant Ponzi scheme. So I'll skip the video. I mean, it's on um, YouTube. You can watch the whole documentary, 60 Minutes. Um, this is the document that he submitted, one of the documents that he submitted. And I, this, I teach a course on forensic accounting, and this is a, one of the documents that my students have to read. And there are like about 27 or 28 red flags that this guy has cited. I only reproduce two of them. Um, he basically said that there are one of the two things that are happening. Firstly, his performance line is too good to be true. So how could it be? Either he's genuinely making this money, the returns are correct, but he's doing it illegally because he's doing front running. He has access to inside information. Uh, uh, he or he knows what his big client, some big client is going to do, so he buys ahead of the client, and basically the profits are real, but they have been they are ill-gotten, right? Which is which is illegal. But the second possibility, he says, the profits are fake; they are never there. He is cooking the books. So why would uh, people give him money? And that's a separate story altogether, but it's a $50 billion fraud. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. It's a scheme in which investors give you money and you are promised some returns, which he's been delivering for like good 20, 25 years. We're not talking about some small little scam uh, in, in a small little country. Uh, big pension funds gave money to this guy. Um, and... Uh, how would he pay them, you know, if people are entering the scheme and they have been guaranteed returns or promised some returns which are excellent returns. So what happens, how are they paid out? Well, he kept taking money in from new investors and using that money out, using that money to pay out old investors who want to leave the scheme, which is what you think exactly what happens in a Ponzi scheme. But of course, we know that that can't sustain. And ultimately, he was exposed and he was, you know, arrested and he, I think he, he was released from prison only recently. Maybe he's still in prison, I don't remember. He makes another point. In red flag number four, he makes a point. Um, he's basically, you don't have to read the whole thing, I'll just, this is uh, from my other course and I don't want to get into the complexities of it. But basically, he used the same logic that we are talking about. He says, Bernie... You are saying you are making this money by using a certain strategy of buying and selling call options. The number, amount of money that you said you have made requires you to have bought and sold so many options in a year or two years. Well, the total traded volume on the exchange for that particular option is less than what you need to have done to have made that money. Therefore, you are a fraud. You need more than 100% market share. And nobody has that. Nobody has that kind of a market share. And there are like 23 other red flags. We don't want to go into it. And some of them are using proof by contradiction. But I think you get the point here. The point is that it's the same idea. The same idea that you were taught in school. That it's absurd. If these return, And nobody asked that question. You know, it's been going on for 50 years. 50 billion dollars evaporated. People have given money. They lost all this money and they didn't apply their mind. What is causing this? And this guy who's skeptical and, you know, he learned mathematics and he didn't forget what he learned and he was using it in his work, was able to figure out that something was terribly wrong. The whole world didn't agree with him. In fact, the tragedy, the tragedy, you will not believe it. He talked about the very submissions he made. This is the last one. SEC did not arrest him or put him, you know, in trouble because of the submissions. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He was so powerful a guy. The Ponzi scheme became so big and was so unsustainable that Bernie Madoff went and confessed. He was arrested after a confession, which he did on his own, which had nothing to do with the six or seven submissions made by 
Harry Marco Polos to SEC. That's the tragedy of the case. The guy is so smart and he's figured it out, but the whole world still doesn't agree with him. The regulator doesn't agree with him. He's given the, all the proof and the evidence and yet the regulator didn't agree with him. It's like a crazy, crazy, uh, you know, uh, situation out there. Uh, but the point is that um, the idea, the idea that he used, how did he come to that insight? How is this one guy comes to the insight that almost everybody who, who looks at this person and believes in him is completely wrong? His wife didn't know. His kids didn't know. One of his kids actually committed suicide after, after this thing happened. Anyway. Now, there's a variation of this trick. Proof by contradiction leads to an absurd outcome and one ends up discovering a common belief as was explained through the examples of Buffett on dot-com, then Ralph Wanger on disk drive industry and Harry Marco Polis on Bernie Madoff's fraud. So by, uh, by being able to use this method, they at least prevented losing money by participating in those situations. But the general idea is that you look for evidence to disprove a theory. To do that, you have to have many theories. That's what he had. He had two theories. You know, we, there are two. He said, "This is too good to be true." What's what's happening? There are two plausible explanations, and he's now looking for evidence as to which one. It turned out that when he figured out the call option thing, that the first explanation was no longer valid. It was sort of disproved. Now, if you have, in order to prove something, you have to have multiple theories in your head. Most people, unfortunately, can't do this. They find it very difficult to hold conflicting theories in their head. And one of the hallmarks of good thinkers, in my view, is that they always have the ability to hold many conflicting theories in their head. They can function. They don't get stressed out. They don't care. They, they, their brains don't sort of, you know, blow up or something. You know, there is cognitive overload of processing two, three, four alternate theories, plausible explanations. This is exactly how good thinkers think. This is exactly, by the way, how Sherlock Holmes used to think. You know, the, the character Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character but was based on a real person, by the way, who had attributes very similar to what was described in, 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 the, in those stories. So in one of the stories, Watson uh, Art asks um, Holmes, do you have a theory? He says, yes, but it's a tentative one. And I'll talk more, talk more about uh, this using another mathematical model later on. It's like, you know, there's a murder and you're trying to figure out who's done it. And um, Sherlock Holmes has been invited to investigate into the matter. And he quickly figures out that there could be three or four or five people who could have done it. You know, it could be the butler, could be the wife, could be the brother-in-law, could be, you know, the neighbor or some business partner. And then... and he, and Sherlock Holmes has no particular attachment to any of these theories. He's entertaining evidence, all these theories in his head. He's keeping them in his head. But one by one, one of these theories or two of these theories sort of drop off because they've been falsified, they've been contradicted. He found something that shows that it couldn't possibly be true. So something like the neighbor was not there on the scene. You know, you thought he was, but he was somewhere else. He had an alibi or something like that. You know how it goes. So, and over a period of time, he ends up with an explanation. And he actually says that. How I've often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So Sherlock Holmes was very good at falsifying his theory. And falsification is a very, very powerful way to think. And the one guy who made this a very popular idea um, is Nassim Taleb. And Nassim Taleb um, spoke about the concept of what he called as a black swan. You know, what does this mean? It means that, let's say that there is a notion that all swans are white. It's a proposition. And you believe in the proposition that all swans are white. How do you prove the proposition? Well, um, it's based on Karl Popper, the famous um, philosopher who was sort of a uh, mentor to um, Nassim Taleb. And he said that if you go around looking for swans to prove that all swans are white, that really doesn't help. I mean, you may look at 10 swans and all 10 of them are white. That doesn't mean that all swans are white. And you may look at a hundred or a thousand or a million or a billion swans. And if each and every one of them turn out to be white, that still does not 
prove the notion that all swans are white. But if you cite a single black swan, that immediately destroys the notion that all swans are white. That theory is completely falsified by the citing of one piece of disconfirming evidence. And it's important if you are going to be working in the investment field to use this trick of falsification all the time. You're trying to make predictions about what's happening. You're trying to understand the world, what the hell is going on. Which one of those three or four theories could be playing out? And you have to have multiple hypotheses in your head. And you try to falsify them. You look for things that will falsify them. And that, take th that takes time. I'll give you an example from my current experience. So there's a company called Aisha Motors. You probably know about it. They own a division called Royal Enfield, which is a division which makes bullet motorcycles. And uh, it's an iconic brand and it's a very successful company and it's run by a phenomenal entrepreneur and it's been a huge value creator. The stock's down from a high of 30,000 to something like 20,000 bucks. It's down by, you know, almost a third. Uh, and the reason why it's down, apparently, is that Aisha Motors, Royal Enfield division, the motorcycle division, has experienced volume degrowth. So their sales have dropped. Fine. Now, I like that company, I love the entrepreneur, and I'm looking at this as an opportunity, this is a good time to buy. Um, now, the question that I have to answer is that why is this degrowth happening? Now, there are lots of theories. One theory is that they had a strike. You know, they make bikes which have long um, queues, wait, waiting periods. And... Uh, they couldn't produce because they had a labor problem in one of their factories and they had a strike. And as a result of this, they couldn't produce. So, the, so it seems as if, they, if you believe in this theory, if you believe in this narrative which I'm taking you down the road, then you would imagine you will believe that, well, this is a temporary problem. It's not that people are not buying bikes. They can't get it. They want it, but they can't get it because they have not been able to produce enough bikes. Now, this happened for a couple of months, by the way. And then new information came in that... The degrowth is not just limited to Royal Enfield, it's across the industry, in the whole two-wheeler industry. Every company in the two-wheeler industry has experienced degrowth in the last few months. And there's an inventory problem, you know, you may have read about it. Now, the moment you read that, the first theory is falsified. Right? It couldn't be the explanation. So you drop that because you have to tell your mind, okay, I had a theory, that theory was very powerful, very exciting, maybe it was an opportunity. But... Now there are more aspects, as you think deeply and read through the situation, you encounter that, um, well, if you look at the history of Indian automobile industry, two-wheeler industry, it's been a growing industry for a long time, you know, it's been growing, growing, growing for a long, long time, for 25, 30 years. But if you look closer into the data, this is not the first time this inventory buildup has happened. It is not the first time. It's happened in the past. Sometimes people take a pause before they buy a bike. And over here, there might be plausible reasons for that happening because the government has changed laws and uh, they have made insurance more expensive and uh, ABS uh, brakes have come and that has made the bikes more expensive. A lot of people are feeling the pinch and therefore they are deferring their purchase of bike. And maybe um, they will defer it for a few months, but ultimately they will buy because they think because their affordable income is going up and they really need to buy a bike and they will buy it. So uh, over a period of time. Now, is that theory playing out? Or there's another one now. Historically, if you look at the Western world or the developed world, I should say, automobile industry is a cyclical industry, which means that volumes go up and then they go down and they go up and they go down. And the earnings go up and they go down and they go up and they go down. Well, that has not happened to Indian automobile industry yet. And there are good reasons for that because of, you know, urbanization and low base and a lot of people uh, didn't have any vehicle and affordable incomes have been going up and the market has been growing, 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 growing. But what is so unique about an industry in India which is cyclical, do you think at some point of time, we don't know when, at some point of time, it will start displaying the characteristics of the automobile industry that you see elsewhere in the world? And if that's true, is that happening now? Is this, the, is this slowdown the first sign of Indian automobile industry in the two-wheeler space moving away from a secular growth story to a cyclical story? Because if it is, 
then the consequences on the valuation are very very important because the way you value cyclicals are very different from the way, way, way you value secular growth so you have a third theory here now and you just don't know the answer and if you want to be a good thinker you don't want to have any emotional attachment to any of those answers even though you own the stock you want to believe it's come down from the price you purchase and you want to believe that oh this is just a strike thing you know it will go away let me buy more let me average more. all those feelings come to you but if you do those things then you are not thinking right and the reason why you're not thinking right is because you're not using uh, evidence that clearly falsifies some of your theories and you're not focusing on the possibility that there might be a saturation happening low level likelihood in my view i just don't have enough data to know the answer either way and therefore i decide to not decide therefore i must entertain um conflicting theories in my head until one of them or most of them but one have been falsified this is what investing is about that you're always dealing with conditions of uncertainty you never have complete information and if one theory goes another one comes up which one of them is playing out another trick that's useful is called reductionism these are all related ideas by the way i'm still on the first uh, trick proof of contradiction one of them is called reductionism again you started this in school is something like this you know you reduce the problem to a simpler form as you see this is what you started in algebra right you have a equation which is uh, looking slightly complex at least to the person who started you know learning algebra for the first time and the teacher tells him or her that this is how you do it step by step you reduce it to a more manageable you know uh, situation uh, a stage and then you know we'll take it to the next stage right now in some in this situation we have solved reduce the problem to a simpler form in some situation we reduce the problem to a more fundamental discipline notice hey you started from math and you still in math but in some situations as i will explain you start from social science and you end up to hard science uh and that's a very very powerful way of thinking now why is that because hard science are fundamental sciences soft science social science is our our sciences which are based on predictions about how humans are going to behave and humans are quite unpredictable when it comes to predicting the behavior they, they you know it's very difficult to do that so when you have to deal with things like if i reduce interest rates will people's demand for homes will go up well logically it should but what really happens we don't know because in japan that didn't happen there are many countries where it didn't happen so you can't treat it like a law of physics but if you could reduce a problem the point the general point is is something that charlie munger warren buffett's partner one of the you know smartest men that i know of he said that if you really want to understand the world and you're trying to explain something or you want to come up with some explanation of what the hell is going on you said you can never make any explanation that can be made in a more fundamental way than any other way than the most fundamental way therefore if you move from hard science sorry from soft science social sciences to hard sciences you have used the trick of reductionism i'll give you another example this is the case study that i used to do in class um way back in 2003 4 four or five or six around that time there was another bubble at that time the bubble at the time was in wind energy and there used to be a company which is in still around about the stocks like selling at 99% below its peak valuation it was a company called suzalon right at the time when i did the case study the stock the aggregate market cap of this company was about 45000 crore it went to 60 and now it's gone to almost nothing 60000 and nothing now i wanted to show to class by using the tricks that i have just described to you including the reductionism trick that there is something absurd going on when i was speaking about when the price was when the market value was 45 46000 crores here is what i did i said that okay let's just do what buffett did if you bought suzalon today at 45000 crore valuation 
then if you want a return of at least 10-12% India interest rates are higher so we'll ask for 13-14% interest uh, uh, you know return minimum required return how much money does Suzlon need to make in earnings to justify this valuation forever and ever and ever assume no growth okay so we have a, and if there is not, if, if you're not making sufficient in the next year then you have to make the next year so you can figure out in some very rudimentary manner what Suzlon needs to make six or seven years down the road to justify today's valuation using this kind of thinking. Of course, at that time, everybody was crazy about wind power and wind energy will change the world and Suzlon is the world's la second largest player and it's a game changer and you can't do without it. Everybody is going to buy wind power and they are the ones who make wind turbines and they have the technology and there were all kinds of narratives which would justify that valuation of 46. There were research reports and glossy, you know, uh, um, reports that given by sell site analysts that this is a great company and you know it's a great buy. What I was trying to do in the class was using proof by contradiction and reductionism to show that this can't be. So what I did was using Buffett's methodology I came to the point when I said that you need to earn so much in four or five years and that's the bottom line and just like Buffett he moved up he went from bottom line profits to pre-tax profits he stopped there he said, look around the world and nobody earns 80 billion or 60 billion, 50 billion. But I didn't want to stop there because I wanted to show the power of reductionism to my students. I said, let's imagine that you need that kind of money. This is the amount of money you need pre-tax. And we move up until we reach revenue. Because we know that this is the margin in the business. Even if the margins go up because of scale economics, you can give you the benefit of that. You need a minimum revenue of that much. And we know that how much is the revenue on a per megawatt of electricity that you will generate through your turbines, what you are charging from your customers to figure out unit volume needed. Now unit volume moving from market valuation, history, uh, you know, euphoria and all that which is, you know, psychology of the people from a social science now moving towards physics. I have moved to a point that you need to have so many megawatts of energy capacity sold in that year to have those earnings to have this value to, to justify this valuation today and then from there I moved on to say show that well wind energy is a very unique you know kind of it's an intermittent energy source it's not a continuous source and there are places where there is a lot of wind and there are places where there is none so you have you have to only make put installed wind turbines where there is a lot of wind and sometimes the wind which is a lot is in places where there is no population you know North Pole for example has a lot of wind but there is no population so you are only limited to those locations where there is wind and population but those sites are already taken because it's like you know cherry picking anybody who wants to install a turbine will first choose the most uh, windy site with the most uh, near. so every time you install a new turbine it will be at an inferior location compared to the previous one right so that was one point that I made. I was able to show that there isn't enough place on this planet Earth in the right locations to have the ability of land to give you the wattage, megawatt uh, uh, capacity that you need in year six or seven to give you the earnings that you need, which will justify the valuation. Therefore, the valuation is wrong. Of course, I was proven completely wrong by the market for a while because I was short the stock. It went to 60,000 crores from 46,000 crores and I lost money then and I got out of the trade and I learned an expensive lesson over there and then it went to almost nothing many years later proving, um, I think John Maynard Keynes right when he said that the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. But that's a separate lesson altogether. So I stopped shorting stocks uh, after making a couple of other similar mistakes. But the point was what I was trying to demonstrate to my students, the power of these simple ideas of using elementary mathematics and moving from the field in which you are operating to a field of science, pure science. In this particular case, physics. There isn't enough place. If there isn't enough place, how the hell will you have those megawatts? If you can't have those megawatts, you can't have the revenue. If you can't have the revenue, you can't have the earnings. If you can't have those earnings, then this valuation is wrong. It's so a very logical reasoning starting from physics. Of course, I ended up in physics, but you could say I start from physics and end up in market valuation. I 
Idea number two. And this is true because, you know, almost all frauds, almost all frauds, you look at a lot of frauds that have happened in the recent past. If you look at the people who have done forensic work on those companies, they find out, well, they look at the revenue model. They look at, you see, almost all frauds involve fudging the revenue because, you know, you have to fudge earnings. You can't fudge earnings without fudging revenue because... You cannot, because otherwise, if you don't fudge the revenue and the earnings keep going up, people are saying, what the hell, how are you making so much money on this business margin? The honest guy is not making, you're doing something crooked. So the only way a fraudster can sustain a fraud is by fudging the revenue. Now, if you fudge the revenue, there are two components in the revenue. One is the price that you charge and one is the volume. You can't fudge the price. Because everybody knows the price. People will ask you on concourse, what is your unit price and all that. So you have to be true about that. You can only fudge the volume. If you fudge the volume, and there you can go on for a goodly while, and the people who are good in forensic, people like Harry Marco Polo, the people who are good in cracking frauds, they attack the company, they find out weakness in their entire hypothesis in the unit volume. This is what I was doing over here, that there is no way, I was not alleging any fraud here, of course, but I was saying that there's too much optimism in market valuation, but in fraudulent situations also, you will often find that there, there is no way the company could have sold so many units because they don't have so many dealers. They don't have the number of trucks needed to ship those many things out of the factory. They don't have the capacity to make those many things. You know, coming back to physics, physics, we're coming to a place, a, look, uh, a, a domain about which nobody can question. You don't have the capacity, you don't have the electricity, you know, you, you need to consume so much electricity to make those many things that you say you are say, selling and therefore you are producing those revenues and earnings and all that. But hey, your electricity connection allows you to make only, there is a company called MRSS, I don't know if you know this, it's a fraudulent company. They found out, the kids found out over there, some value investors I know, they did some forensic work. You are a market research company and you have 40 computers or something like that and you are you know, showing that they have like few hundreds of crores of revenues. So where are your computers? If you look at the fixed assets, there are no computers. So the number is wrong, the fudging of revenue is happening here. So you're using elementary ideas of reductionism. Inversion, idea number two. You set a different school and then you forgot about it. How do you calculate the probability of landing heads at least once in 10 coin tosses? I toss a coin 10 times, there's a 50% chance that it will land heads, there's a 50% chance that it will land tails, and I do this 10 times in a row. I want you to calculate the probability of getting at least one heads, which means the probability of one heads plus the probability of two heads plus the probability of exactly three heads and so on till the end of the term, you get a probability of exactly 10 heads. That's the long way of solving the problem. Which is the way you solve the problem or do you taught how to solve the problem? One minus. One minus the probability of all landing tails. And we know how to figure that out. That's 0.5 to the power of 10. All tails, 0.5 to the power of 10. And we deduct that number from 1. And we get an answer, 99.9%. So, simple tool, you figured that out, you did it in school, then you forgot about the whole thing, right? Let's come back to it now. Let's apply it on a daily basis. Famous uh, algebraist, he used to say, invert. This is what we did, inversion. We inverted, you know. We say, instead of solving the problem forwards, let's do it backwards, right? So, here's an equation 1, 20x plus 10y equals 5x plus 8y plus 10. By using inversion, what, is we, what are we doing in this inversion? In this kind of inversion, we are taking things on the right hand side of the equation and putting it on the left hand side to make it a simpler form. Right? If we do that, we end up with 15x plus 2y is equal to 10. We are of course using reductionism. But we are also using inversion. We are shifting things around from one side of the equation to the other side of the e equation. Well, this is a very powerful idea in my work. Very powerful. Tell you how it works. So you build Excel models about the favorite companies that you have. 
and how I think all of you are familiar with Excel, right? You all do, you know, hardcore Excel modeling. But the problem with Excel modeling is that it plays tricks on your mind because if you really want an answer, there are many ways of changing the variables to give the answer you want. So, you know, it can really fool you. If you want to fool yourself, Microsoft Excel is a good way of doing it. You know, there's a famous quote that says, that goes like this, that the most um, popular software for writing fiction is not Microsoft Word, it's Microsoft Excel. At least people in financial markets will agree with that. So there is a problem here. The problem is that you are coming up with these fancy assumptions about future prospects of your favorite business com company that you want to invest in or already invested in, coming up with projections of wonderful cash flows and earnings and growth rates and profitability and capital turns and, and uh, tax rates and if you bring that all back to present value, you get a crazy valuation, the valuation you want and you want to give a buy recommendation and so on and so forth. Well, there is a way of dealing with that bias. The way to deal with that bias is the same point that Buffett made, that forget about the future, forget about the prospects, forget about what you are thinking and dreaming and visualizing. Just in the valuation model, you are arriving at a valuation model based on future cash flows, bringing them to present value. Those numbers are coming from, you know, a movie called Mungeri Lal Ki Haseen Sapne. There was a movie, if you remember. Basically, pure fantasies. Your pure fantasies are all embedded in the Excel model. The goal seek function that you look for is not really needed because it's already embedded in you, by the way. It's all being reflected in all the beautiful numbers that you're projecting into the future. You are bringing them to present value and coming with a number, which is the current value. You're arriving at the current value. He said, don't do this. Take the current market value and put it on the left hand side. And then figure out what the company needs to do to justify the valuation. The same point which, by the way, uh, Buffett did in his head. But you're doing it in a more formal manner. Basically to figure out, um, what am I paying for growth? What am I paying for growth? If I buy a bond today, um, today's interest rates, for example, pre-tax interest rates on AAA bonds would be something like 9%. Or maybe 10, let's assume 10% per annum. Which means if I pay 100 bucks, it will give me 10 bucks for a long, long time. That means that the value of what I'm paying is 100 bucks, but the earnings that are coming out of it is 10. And the reason I'm doing this is because the 10 is not going to grow. So if you are going to grow, a no, uh, if you're going to value a non-growth perpetuity in today's world, if you are certain about those numbers coming in, the value is 100 bucks. That means 10 times pre-tax earnings is the multiple to pay on a perpetual earnings stream. Very simple ballpark, you know, formula. Now you look at a company which is selling at 30 times earnings, pre-tax earnings. So now you know that there is a part of the earnings which you bring back to present value will be the bond valuation. It's like the component of bond valuation embedded inside the stock valuation or the non-growth valuation. So from the current value of the company, you can reduce the value of non-growing perpetuity and then arrive at what are you paying for the growth? Fine, it's very easy to figure out how much is the growth, how much, and then you can attack that and figure out, well, that looks a little optimistic or it's too much or too little. In some cases, you get a very good answer that you're not really paying anything for growth. That this is a company which is involved in some um, uh, research, uh, scientific research, and uh, if the research pays off, if it is successful, the payoff will be fantastic. If it doesn't uh, succeed, then there won't be very many losses. But the core business is very profitable and that will continue. If the market value of the company today is easily explainable by the earnings that are coming from the core business, then that means you're not paying anything for the growth. You're not paying anything for the lottery ticket, which is what value investing is, picking up free lottery tickets. So you're using a simple technique of inversion. Instead of making projections and bringing them to present value, you take the current market value and figure out what the assumptions must be because that's more objective. Because then you have de dealt with those biases that are floating around in your head. There are like many of them and I don't want to go into the details of how many of them are there. But, um, but there are many. So it is a very, very powerful technique that people in my profession used to de-bias themselves. They know that they are prone to falling in love with their ideas. They know that they are prone to being overconfident. They know that they get carried away by the charismatic uh, 
personality of the entrepreneur they know that uh, if they talk to the management they will only hear one side of the story and there are like you know so there are six or seven things that are clearly there which will cause you to be led astray and come up with some crazy uh, fanciful projections about the future and of course if you bring those fanciful projections to the present value you will get a fanciful number and then you will end up with the wrong conclusion that you should be buying that stock maybe you shouldn't do that entire thing at all maybe you should just take the current market value plug it in the valuation model figure out what the growth the embedded growth in the current market value and whether you agree with that growth or not because that will tell you where to because that growth will come from where will it come from market share gains will it come from new products will it come from geographical expansion will it come from price increase that will lead you to those situations once you know that this is the growth that is needed and you ask where is it going to come from that might lead you to the conclusion there is no way it's, it's a you know it's a saturated market you are the there is an organized sector and an unorganized sector the organized sector is already 80% and you are like 60% of the total market so for you to be able to continue to gain market share from the unorganized player is going to not be so much uh, possible as was earlier 3 5 7 years ago so your source of growth which is required which you have already figured out is not going to come from there where the hell will it come from then you eliminate one or the other and you come to the conclusion it's not going to happen and therefore this valuation is wrong it's a technique that we use all the time every day but there's more to it when you do about inversion because what are you trying to do well you're asking a question in instead of asking how should i succeed which is a very common thing that people are taught in business schools or you know campuses like this they have all these lovely role models and they bring them in and they come and give you talks on how i became a great entrepreneur and how i became a good startup fund or whatever they bring in because they can't get the guys in prison right it's very hard to bring people who you know i don't think anil amani is like to come over here and give you a talk on you know how to destroy few lakh crores of rupees in a few years time you know he's not going to come and they are not going to invite him but this is the problem in education that a lot of the learning comes from studying failure and therefore instead of asking you invert it you basically look instead of looking for failures success stories you look for failures so you ask how to fail and then just don't do those things whatever those things could be and there are a lot of you know uh, work done on this and instead of thinking about how to make your business better think about how to ruin it and then simply avoid those things is such a powerful idea such a powerful idea because there are only few ways to ruin things there are many ways to succeed and if you're copying other people's success stories you may be you know thinking like if i eat the same uh, food that warren buffett eats then i will become like warren buffett it doesn't work like that they'll be doing 50 other things but there are only a few there are only a handful just about maybe seven or eight things that people do to become go, to, go back to zero there are very few ways in which you have colossal failures and there are many many ways in which you have colossal successes why not learn from colossal failures by simply avoiding those things and the smartest people in the world know this know this you know take service industry is the industry is very easy to piss people off and they get pissed off and they get on facebook and and twitter and you know whatsapp and they bitch about the company and it sort of goes viral and you know uh, an airline is caught carrying a passenger you know dragging a passenger off the of the flight and somebody takes a video and it goes viral or you know something like that basically you know the service industry and i had this experience by the way i i have a position in a company which is in the service industry and i know the guy who runs it and um i sent him this quote as the industry we are dealing with uh, a few about 10 to 15000 customers a day every day okay and he said my god i hadn't think of this the people are running the company they don't think they don't think about you know what are the ways in which you can piss off your customers and let's just try to avoid that you know in what are the kind of things in a restaurant business that you want to avoid few, a few i mean you don't want to have cockroach in your food that's one clear uh, you don't want to have a uh, very uh, nasty speaking or unclean or uncouth uh, waiters you don't want to have dirty uh, tables or toilets there are three or four or five things you want to completely completely avoid if you want to succeed or if you don't want to fail um 
you have a question no. okay and this is such a powerful idea about inversion that instead of chasing success i find out what causes failure and i just simply run the hell away from it you know if you had a choice by the way you all we all know that we're going to die but if i gave you a choice you know i was some kind of a god like figure and i told you that i have a, i can give you one of the two things you can ask me two only one one of these answer to one of these questions you can either figure out when you're going to die or where you're going to die which is the question you would want me to answer obviously so there are all sorts of places where people die i'm talking about figure of speech in the business world when people do dumb things and not just and you want to you know you're a collector of folly this is what i teach you know in business um, uh behavioral finance course about how smart people do dumb very dumb things every year i got new cases every year i get a few new cases this next year will be uh, anil amani <laughs> um, um so every year you know look at what is happening with boeing what they have done you know you you're reading about that right you know they are giving you those add ons you know they compromise the security and safety of their planes and people have died and you know they lost their business or look what Volkswagen did when they cheated on the diesel thing and they're paying billions and billions of dollars and even in india they have been fined and uh, and the amount of losses they have to pay and every year you're going to get example after example of mass folly and you got to know that this is the thing i want to avoid you know it's like buffett uh, munger once said that you don't have to pee on an electric fence to learn not to do it <laughs> i mean it's less painful maybe it is not at all painful to watch other people do it you know you can actually if you want take a look <laughs> so you find the functional equivalent of people peeing on electric fences and you're at a safe distance and you said i don't want to go close to those fences is so much learning value over there just by watching watching dumb behavior watching things that people do and then get destroyed you want <laughs> this guy is completely oblivious to what is happening <laughs> What happens when you see this light? People do amazingly dumb things. You see your green light turning yellow instead of slowing down. They kind of speed up. You know, there are all kinds of reasons which causes that. It's a case I do in my class when I try to explain. There is a loss aversion. There is a overconfidence. There is a system one taking over system two. There are three, three or four things that are happening, and one of you is nodding his head because he's seen that in Flame University, where I gave uh, this um, the, 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 these slides for like four days, three days. now one one big way in which people kind of blow up which is this common factor you know why if you look at all the companies all the entrepreneurs who are losing their companies you know z guy is losing his company and uh, uh, anil amani is going to lose his company and the jet fellow is going to lose his company you find there is one common factor which comes up over and over and over again over and over again it's a single most common cause of business failure over leverage often caused by over confidence and it's like you know very easy to understand that you know why you know if you are you know in a leverage capital structure like the equity guy is right in the end you know that's a dog in the back of the queue you know they have to feed all the other dogs before your turn comes and there's nothing left for you the equity guys are the last you know claimants of the cash flow so debt debt can cause a lot of mortality lot of mortality there is lot of mortality in business world because of excessive debt and of course uh, people don't realize that they get over confident they think that they can get away with it there is not a problem at all and it won't happen to them it happened to other people and all kinds of things so debt is a big problem here and you clearly you know if you if you want to avoid failure if you want to if you don't want to fail by the way it applies not just to in not just to uh, business it also applies personally don't borrow money don't borrow money 
you're going to leave this place, you get place, you'll get credit card, maybe you already have them, and then you'll get offers for um, car loans and home loans, and uh, and it just doesn't add to my mind, you know. They they want you to spend and overspend. They want you to be late. If you work for a credit card company, um, if you do the math of which are the most profitable customers, they're the ones who are late. They're the ones who don't pay on time. They're the ones who are delinquent. They're the ones who pay penal charges and penal interest and late payment fees and all that. They want you to do that. So the system is going after you. They want you to become slaves for life. So you've got to learn how to fight the system. Some people don't know, and maybe they get away because they have, you know, a rich brother or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you need these anti-models. And every year, every few years, and by the way, they don't all have to be Indian. Let's not be, you know, uh, assume that only Indians do dumb things. There are a lot of dumbness around the world. There are every few years you will collect. You read the history of what happened to their, you know, what did they do in life? You know, how did they end up here? They were there, one of the richest people, or the most prosperous people, the most respected people, and look what has happened. By the way, this isn't just about the money. It's also about reputation. It's about, you know, what happened, you know, how you behaved uh, in life. In my management checklist, which I have as part of my uh, firm's uh, investment philosophy, there is a component called management checklist, a business checklist, management checklist, valuation checklist. Um, inversion is there. So, um, some time back I was working on creating a corporate governance checklist, you know, the kind of good practices you would look out for in businesses you want to invest in, and then I inverted the problem apart from asking how to make money by investing in businesses with good corporate governance practices, I also asked myself, how to lose your shirt by investing in businesses with lousy governance and then simply avoid those businesses. What are the five or six things that you want to see in bad governance practices? You know, things like over-aggression in capital allocation, um, re related party transactions, paying yourself a lot of salary and perks and putting your family members on the board and, you know, paying them lavishly without their making any significant contribution. To the, uh, uh, to, the, to the company, and so on. Again, the point is that you, you invert the whole thing. I mean, it used backward thinking in addition to forward thinking. I want to actively look for poor management so I can avoid them. In particular, I look for a terrible track record in making you know, expensive acquisitions, a terrible track record in diversifications, crazily expanding using borrowed money, or creating the business castles using political clout. I avoid that because I don't like businesses which are run by people who are close to politicians or businesses which are run by politicians because a lot of their competitive advantage is coming from the political clout and that's not really sustainable. So for me, that's a no-no. Idea number three. There are seven. We are on the third one. The big ones are done, so it will be shorter, I think. Except the last one, that will be like a three or four hour thing. <laughs> uh, idea number three. Law of large numbers. Now, in probability theory, law of large numbers is the theorem that describes the result of performing the same experiment in a large number of times. According to the law, the average of the results obtained from a large number of trials should be close to the expected value. You know this because you can toss a coin at 10 times and you may get 8 heads and 2 tails. But if you toss it a billion times, you won't get 800 million um, uh, heads and 200 million tails. Something will happen to pull it to the average. It's called law of large numbers, or there's another way of describing it, it's called mean reversion. Doesn't matter, I mean, whether you use the idea of mean reversion from statistics, or you use the idea of law of large numbers, again, from probability or statistics, it's the same thing. It's a very powerful idea, that as time passes by, things, the noise that you see here, in, sh in small number of trials, will disappear that the 0.5 is the attractor, the 0.5, the probability of, you know, how, you know if, you, if you throw, you know, uh, 10,000 uh, tosses, you should get 5, roughly 5,000 heads and 5,000 tails. Now, let me talk about casino investing. You know, casino and investing don't look like an oxymoron, but really, it's not true. You know, you can really learn to be a very smart investor if you uh, go to the casino. You should go to the casino, by the way. Uh, but... With a, with a caveat. So let's look at a casino. Who could 
is this? Anywhere else in the country, I was a bookie, a gambler, always looking over my shoulder, hassled by cops day and night. But here, I'm Mr. Rothstein. I'm not only legitimate, but running a casino. And that's like selling people dreams for cash. I hired an old casino pal, Billy Sherbert, as my manager, and I went to work. For guys like me, Las Vegas washes away your sins. It's like a morality car wash. It does for us what Lourdes does for humpbacks and cripples. And along with making us legit, comes cash. Tons of it. I mean, what do you think we're doing out here in the middle of the desert? It's all this money. This is the end result of all the bright lights and the comp trips, of all the champagne and free hotel suites and all the broads and all the booze. It's all been arranged just for us to get your money. That's the truth about Las Vegas. We're the only winners. The players don't stand a chance. And their cash flows from the tables to our boxes, through the cage, and into the most sacred room in the casino. The place where they add up all the money, the holy of holies, the count room. So, a casino is a safe place, really. I mean, but not for the players. It's for the guy who owns the casino. It's a great business in that sense. And why is that? Many reasons. One, odds in favor of casino. Every bet that you make is a bet where the odds are slightly or more than slightly in favor of the casino. Right? That's one big reason uh, for it. Number two, but even if the odds are in your favor, that doesn't mean that the, hundred, the, uh, the probability of your winning is 0%. No, the probability of your winning may be 48% and the probability of uh, casino winning could be 52%. Um, but if the probability of the player winning is 48% and he puts in a million dollars, it can break the casino. So you have a second principle, cap on max bet size. They never allow you to bet more than a certain amount of money, right? On a single bet, on a single bet. They put a cap, you don't take more than, um, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 or depending upon the size of the casino, the net worth of the casino. They have this. And the third one is the law of large numbers. They want lots of players. They want lots of players. Because we know that when you walk into a casino and you gamble, you might win. Even when you're leaving, you might win and walk out with your winnings. But on average, the, the aggregate amount of uh, losses will be more for the customers than for the casino. Casinos normally will always win at the end of the day. It will end up with more money than it had its, when it started out in the morning. That's what law of large numbers is. Right. So you have what three principles. One, odds are in your favor. I'm talking about if you are the casino owner. Odds are in your favor. You put a max bet so that some lucky guy doesn't break you. By putting a large lot of money and basically you don't have the money to pay him. He makes 30x on on the red or not the red or a single number or 38, 37, 36 times the bet on, on, a, on a roulette number. Uh, and you want lots of play, which means diversification. Lots of players. Um, now let's look at a specific situation that from the point of view of the casino player. Here's the American roulette. Uh, there are 38 slots numbered 1 to 36 and there is a 0 and a double 0. And the payout is 35 to 1. If you bet your 1, one rupee on, on your lucky number 8, and if the ball lands on 8, you win 35, otherwise you lose 1. And if you gamble 1,000, then probability of winning is 1 on 38 is 2.63%. The probability of losing is 97.37%. So a 2.63% chance of winning 35,000 rupees and a 97.37% chance of losing $1,000. Therefore, you end up with a negative value of 53.20. Right? Now, some smart guy, smart with inverted commas, decides that I'm going to play a safe game. I'm going to spread my money across the table. I'm going to put my money on each number. 
therefore i will reduce risk let's see what happens he puts uh, he he spreads his 1000 bucks on each number that means he put 26 rupees and 32 paisa on each number 0 to 30 Six, uh, 1 to 36 and 0 and double zero then you will have a 100 you will 100% chance you win on one of the numbers 100% chance that you will win 35 times that number 26.32 or 921 and you will give it give away 1000 that means if you if you spread your risk you are guaranteed to lose money this is a powerful lesson over there and the lesson is this It's the same lesson that apply in casino. Casino is a value investor, by the way. One, odds in favor of the investor. Two, cap or max bet size. Three, the law of large numbers diversification. If your odds are not in your favor, what is the big lesson here? If the odds are not in your favor, which is what happened to the player in the casino, then diversification will not help you. It will hurt you. It will turn it into a certainty that you will lose money. but if you are odds are not in your favor and you go in bed once or twice you might get lucky and win and walk away at least there is some chance that you will make some money if you don't spread your risk now what is the powerful lesson that comes from that about investing over the in in that well one big lesson that comes from that is that odds of favor matter when the there are all kinds of strategies in investing when odds are overwhelmingly on in your favor like for example if you're investing in a business which has been around for a long time is dominant it sells something that people need and will be needing for the next 200 300 years toothpaste for example um hopefully um uh, never know uh and um and uh, you're the dominant player in the industry and uh, you have no debt on the balance sheet and you have all the money to do whatever advertising and you're operating in a market where there is a lot of growth potential now that's a low risk business wise kind of a situation the other extreme is venture cap a new startup venture in high technology something that happens in the fifth floor of your room that you took me to recently you know your you know your lab you know whatever your entrepreneurship thing it's a high risk thing now obviously your position sizes will be a function of the kind of investing you are doing right if you are a venture cap fund you will put money in 100 bets you don't know which ones will pay off but you know the most of them will loan won't and many of them will go to zero but the ones that will pay off will wash away all the sins that's how it works but that means if you're doing venture cap then your portfolios will have lots of names it's like a casino where the odds are slightly in your favor but the payoffs of success are enormous but if you're doing the kind of investing that i do which is like investing in well known um dominant businesses which are momentarily cheap for the wrong reasons then you should put fewer names you have more conviction the odds are overwhelmingly that you will make money and therefore you will have fewer names in the portfolio so concentrated bets require odds overwhelmingly in your favor wide spreading of bets necessarily requires um so uh, wide diversification is necessarily required in situation where there is a lot of business risk how about cyclicals you know notice you're talking about uh, the law of uh, um large numbers i talked about that in the short term there's a lot of noise in the long term it disappears the same logic applies in cyclicals steel shipping these are industries which will go through ups and downs and go through ups and downs you will find situations where there is a lot of growth and a lot of optimism and people will expand capacity and the profits that are there right now will sort of disappear it's it's a wide topic i'm not going to spend a lot of time in it but the fact is there is cyclicity many shall be restored that are now fallen and many shall fall that are now in honor ben graham writes this in his book again we come back to the idea of mean reversion that things will not continue the way they are they will change a company is doing badly might start doing better because it will get cleaned up and somebody will come and fix the problems a company is doing extraordinarily well well it will attract competition and maybe the they will make management mistakes and you know great uh, performance is often followed by mediocre performance and a lot of bad performance is often followed by much better performance those are all examples of mean reversion 
and mean reversion as i mentioned is a powerful idea that demonstrates the the principle that i was talking about the law of large numbers bull markets and bear markets can obscure mathematical laws they cannot repeal them which means that you will have periods when indian markets are down 10% 15% 2 or 3 years in a row and then you'll have periods when they will be up a lot but in the long run the total returns that the market will deliver should not be very different from the total returns that the businesses are earning on their own money there's a kind of a convergence return on equity the underlying return on equity of corporate india if it goes up then equity returns in the long run will go up although there will be periods during which there will be large positive returns there will be periods there will be large negative returns but in the long run it is the underlying profitability which will be the same thing as the experiment in the coin toss that's what he is saying these are powerful ideas that you know that when things are not going in your favor then uh, in the business favor then something might happen which will change that you are investing and and the, the, the problem is in the markets when things are not going well people think that is permanent this company is doomed but that's not always the case there are cycles and buying at the bottom of the cycles can make you a lot of money provided you can sell at, at near the peak or you know made enough money you make 7 8 10 x of your money in those situations idea 4 something that you studied i don't know when class 5th or 6th compound we all know this is a very simple thing is a non linear relationship and we all know that if you compound your capital at um 16% versus 14% but if you measure the outcomes over 30 year period then the outcomes will be vastly different because of the power of compounding we all look you've done that but we haven't really paid a lot of attention to the embedded wisdom in the formula there's a formula here which is you familiar with there's a amount which equals principal plus 1 principal into 1 plus r to the power of n well let's talk about delayed gratification what does that mean it means i'm willing to wait i'm willing to wait because i want to i want to maximize this and i cannot to do this i'm willing to have short term pain for long term gains so i may make less money right now because of the things that i'm doing but because of the things that i'm doing will make me a lot of money sometime in the future and we know that works out I and mean, there's a famous experiment called the marshmallow test which proves that you know kids who are able to delay the gratification by not giving in to eating the marshmallow that was offered to them i don't know if you've seen this experiment you all seen that so i don't want to play it but essentially the idea is that if kids are given a choice to accept one marshmallow now versus two marshmallows 15 minutes most of them can't wait 15 minutes they want to you know eat the second one right now um well the fact is that the same logic also applies to to businesses there are businesses which are greedy which end up ruining their uh, entire business model because they are manufacturing life saving drugs and they are buying out the life saving drug brands of other companies and the moment they buy those brands they jack up the price sometimes by 23 times not realizing they are dealing not with chocolate or cookie or candy or biscuits or something like that or tea or coffee but dealing with a uh, non discretionary life saving drug and this greed total greed the greed is coming from here you're focusing on this and when you focus a lot on this and exercise a lot of greed you are killing this even if this number is large if this number becomes zero or become very small this number collapses it's a elementary point but i see failure of people's understanding being manifested in destruction well destruction on a gigantic scale over and over again this is just one example but there are people out there who are the other extreme and those are people who resemble this guy and he says that i'm going to cut prices i'm going to build a loyal customer base i'm going to have customers who keep coming back to me for more and more and more and i'm going to give them amazon prime and i'm going to do a lot of things which will i want them to keep coming back and by the way while i do this uh nobody will want to enter my space because they can't uh there is they will lose a billion billions of dollars of money every month if they try to enter my space and i'm going to pretty much get the bigger wallet share every year of almost every citizen in the world that's what his game plan is in the meantime to get there i don't mind waiting out i'm i'm playing the patient game what you call in hindi lambi race ka ghoda 
right? He's playing out a patient game. And he gives you the, his competitive advantage. When he says what you see on the screen right now, you can read it. How does he get his competitive advantage? One of the big reasons is that he plays the long game. He is willing to focus on the N, not the R. The R may be very mediocre or very low, which is not good enough for most people because they are fixated their time horizons on 2, 3, 4, 5 years. He is talking about 20 years or beyond. There are people like that and you can all know that, you know, this is the richest guy in the world now. If you could find people like this in my world, in the world in which I operate, my job is to find people like this early in their careers. My job is essentially to bet that if these guys were kids in the marshmallow experiment, they would have said no to the marshmallow and waited out 15 minutes to get two marshmallows instead of, you know, having it right now. So Valiant is like the farmer who killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. We see that over and over and over again. They get over aggressive. Either they will increase their prices. What, what happens when you increase your prices? Either you piss off your customers and giving them a reason to go to somebody else. Or you become so profitable and look so attractive to competition that they enter your space and they destroy you. You don't want either of those two things to happen. You want your customers to stay loyal, which means if I have an efficiency in my business, if I have a cost efficiency, if I have scale economics, uh, I have negotiated better for my vendors to get better rates because I'm becoming better. You pass on most of it to your customers. If you do this, what happens to the customer? Wow, what a guy. I want to be with this fellow. I don't want to look at anybody else. I don't want to look at any other vendor. I, why should I go to somebody else? If I buy books on Kindle, I, I used to before I bought Kindle device that should I buy it or not? If I buy it, then what about the other, other devices? And what, if the books are cheaper on the other devices, should I buy there? But today when I buy a book, I don't ever look at what the price of other e-books is. Because I know, and even if I do a test uh, check, I would think, I will find that once in a while, Kindle, Amazon will be more expensive than maybe Nooks or, you know, Barnes & Noble, whatever they, they have over there. But I don't care. The reason I don't care is because this guy has spent 20 years building loyalty and trust. And he's put me on Amazon Prime. And I'm now part of his ecosystem of Amazon Kindle that I can't leave. I'm here for, and I buy like a book, two or three books a week. So, uh, so I end up buying books and conti con will continue. So I've given him loyalty for life. How did um, Jeff Bezos get there? Not just for me, for tens of millions of customers in almost every country. Lifetime royalties. Because he didn't screw you. He kept on cutting prices. The price that he charges you for the Amazon Kindle book is sometimes one third, one fourth of the hardcover price. And I feel very good about it. I'm not, you know, killing trees and I'm, you know, making, you know, saving a lot of money in the whole process. I have no reason to go somewhere else. Even if that someone else charge a lower price and nobody will want to charge a lower price because if they charge a lower price, they will be, they would blow up a lot of capital very shortly, in a very short while. Because the scale economics that he has, the negotiating powers that he has on the publishing companies. And that's what creates this. You have entry barriers that is preventing competition from entering. He's untouchable. And you have customer loyalty. Both of these things create this. And therefore, if I could find just two or three such guys in my life, early on in their careers, I don't have to do anything else. And therefore, it's an inherent point of fig figuring out people who really understand the wisdom of the compound interest formula. People are willing to sacrifice near-term pain to create long-term value. And most people don't fall in that category. Most people don't fall in that category at all. Okay, idea five. It's again something that is said in probability called multiplication rule. Which is that if two events are independent in the sense that the outcome of one event has no influence on the outcome of the other, then the probability that both occur is computed by multiplying the probabilities of the individual events. Remember this? It's just so simple, uh, the, the rule of multiplication. 
in probability. But how do you use it? What is the meaning of it? How important it is in day-to-day -day thinking about the, how the world operates? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, imagine that there's a 90% chance that a bad thing won't happen to you. And there are five such things that are all independent. What is the chance that at least one of those things will happen to you? 41%. Now think of the consequences. Do you really want to do that? You know, that you, 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 st you start going around looking at the world and say, well, I will take this risk, but there's a 90% chance that it, nothing will happen to me. I mean, there's only 10% chance that that event will occur. Um, but there are five ways in which you could be harmed, and each of them look improbable, but only one of them have to happen for you to have an outcome that is unacceptable to you. So what should you be, what should be your attitude towards such a setup? Walk away. Walk away. 41% chance is, looks pretty deadly, right? Compared to the 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. But they're all independent and only one of them has to happen. Think how Buffett uses this thinking. He gives an example of a company in which he's invested. Mid-American Energy. He says, last year, Mid-American wrote off a major investment in zinc recovery project that was initiated in 1998 and became operational in 2002. Large quantities of zinc are present in the brine produced by our Californian geothermal operations and we believed that we could profitably extract that metal. For many months, it appeared that the commercially viable recoveries were imminent. But in mining, just as in oil exploration, Prospects have a way of teasing their developers and every time one problem was solved another one popped up in September We threw in the towel our failure illustrates the importance of a guideline Stay with simple propositions that we usually apply in investments as well as our in operations If one variable is key to a decision and the variable has a 90% chance of going your way The chance for a successful outcome is obviously 90% but if 10 independent variables need to break favorably for a successful result and each has a 90% probability of success, the likelihood, likelihood of your having a winner drops to only 35%. The derivation of that is something which you already know how to derive that. In our zinc venture, we solved most of the problems but one proved intractable and that was one too many. <coughs> Since the chain is no stronger than the weakest link, it makes sense to look for, if you'll excuse an oxymoron, monolinked chains. He said, I don't want businesses which you need 10 things to work out for me to make money. He wants to look at simple businesses, not complex businesses. I mean, look at drug discovery. You start from a molecule and you end up with a drug. And there is FDA in the middle. There is stage one, stage two, stage three, and you're throwing billions and billions of dollars. And even if you get through past stage, three and get the approval, you have to spend money on marketing and hope that the customer will buy it and then hope that there will be no side effects and there will be no lawsuits if there are side effects and so on and so on and on. There are so many things that must happen and happen and the probability of it happening is so remote, so remote. Is there any surprise that Warren Buffett never invests in the pharmaceutical drug discovery industry? It's completely speculative. So many things have to go right and even if you have a high chance of them happening, if one of them had a low chance, the multiplier will bring it down. For example, if there's a 99% chance of A happening and 99% chance of B happening and 99% chance of C happening and a 99% chance of D happening and a 2% chance of E happening and all of them must happen, then for all of them to happen, the aggregate probability is way smaller than 2%. Chain is only as strong as the weakest link is the wrong way of explaining it. Chain is weaker than the weakest link. The 2% is the weak link, is the weakest link, but the multiplier, the probability that you will get will be way below 2% because 0 0.99 into 0 0.99 into 0 0.99 into 0 0.99 into 0 0.02 is way less than 0 0.02. People don't think along those things. They get overconfident. They forget that there's a small variable out there, small likelihood success variable out there. Or even if it is not there, that's the point. He's talking about 90% zinc. He lost money there. It's an elementary idea that you learned in school. Multiplication probability, they taught you, just do it. You know, they talk about urns and balls and uh, dice. And, and that's it. You pass the exam and you, you're through. 
but how do you use these things on a on a daily basis is what will dis- distinguish between a good thinker and a mediocre thinker idea number 6 small probabilities but large consequences these are like and these these are remote possibilities that means there is very small chance of their happening but the consequences are large i mean i'm not saying they're bad but they are large they could be good or they could be bad either way so this is how you were taught balls and urns and you know dice there was never any discussion of consequences right but how can you think of probability without thinking about consequences what if there's a 1% chance that you will lose everything that you had all your money all your reputation should you enter that game well these two guys did they were nobel laureates and they they ran they are the guys who wrote the black and shows option pricing model they had a fund which sort of blew up and they were specs they were arbitraging the spreads between 30 year treasury bond yields and 29 year and 3 quarters treasury bond yields and they went wrong basically the market became irrational longer than they could remain solvent and basically they went basically blew up their money and buffett says to make money they didn't have and didn't need they were already rich they risked what they did have and did need if you read through this he gives you a very important thought experiment he says if you hand me a gun and you ask me to it's an empty gun you know it's, maybe it's got a thousand chambers in it and you ask me to put it on my temple and pull it once and there's only one bullet in in the chamber in in, in the gun uh how much money should i ask to be paid for is i don't want to get get into that game because even though the chance of my getting killed is remote i just don't want to get killed at all but people don't think along those lines now if i give you a mathematical problem and i told you there's a 1% chance that you could lose um um there's a 1% chance that you could lose 100 rupees and there's a 99% chance that you could make 10000 rupees right what if you are worth only 100 rupees what if you are worth not even 100 rupees it's all that you have can you take a risk with something that is important to you no matter how good the odds because the expected value of that game that i just told you is phenomenal i'm i'm not i'm now telling you that nobel laureates are making those mistakes because they're forgetting about la and these are like mathematicians of all the people you know they written complex formulas and derive them and really accept them they are used on a daily basis in pricing options and futures and we're talking about the gigantic mistakes that even nobel laureates make in forgetting some elementary principle that you simply do not risk what's important to you no matter how good the odds no matter how the upside they only look at the upside they didn't look at the downside and of course if somebody gave you a game and it said that if you win 100 bucks you lose 100 bucks if you if if you if you lose you, your loss will be if you if you play a game if if you lose the game you lose 100 bucks if you win the game you make 10000 bucks uh and if your net worth is 10000 or 15000 bucks you should play the game you should play the game every time because you can afford to lose 100 bucks if things don't work out but if you only had 100 bucks you should always walk away from such a game and when i say 100 bucks it also means something which is non financial something like your reputation should you do things uh that has a small chance of ruining your reputation even though there's a very strong ch- a big chance that you will never be caught there's this very strong chance that crime criminals will not get caught fraudsters will not get caught but if they get caught the consequences are so severe it's the upside that makes them go into those games it's like jumping out of a plane which opens up uh you know without a para with a parachute that will open up 99% of the time now the other thing that comes in this is the repeated of the trial you notice you talked about urns and dice and you know how many trials you do if you keep jumping out of a plane if you jump once 99% of the chance 99% chance that you won't get killed but if you keep doing this behavior this risk seeking behavior if you keep jumping out of planes with parachute that open up only 99% of the time they don't open up 99% of the time and fail to open up only 1% of the time if you keep doing this then 
the outcome is inevitable. The probability you can work out the math uh, is what is the probability that you will get killed at least once. Well, you don't have to get killed at least once. Once is enough. <laughs> you only have to get killed once. The chances go up exponentially. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and 5 minutes to ruin it. Now I have a last idea. This will take a slightly more time, but it's a very powerful idea. You le learned this. You did this in school. Bayesian reasoning. How to think like a, you know, how to work out Bayes theorem. Remember that? It's the most boring thing that I did in school, by the way. And I wish I was taught it differently, the way I'm going to, you know, talk about it today. We call it conditional probability. And this is how it was kind of, basically the idea is, that you're trying to measure the probability of an event given that another event has happened. Right? That's what the game plan is, right? And this is the way they teach you. And you know, you, my head was spinning then, and while I was putting the, making this slide, it was spinning then also. Uh, it was, when it was over, I was glad it was over. A couple of decades later, I discovered this guy, Danny Kahneman, the father of behavioral economics. And he, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, explains Bayesian thinking and Bayesian reasoning without using elaborate mathematics. And he gives you a way of figuring out how to crack Bayes theorem. And he puts, you know, uh, he puts this equation that there are these posterior odds and there are prior odds that there is a likelihood ratio. And I'll explain these terms to you in a minute. Basically, you have some initial probability, which was the prior odds. Then there was some information that came in and that changed your belief to a posterior odds. Okay, this is what it is. That you have some views, then you get some new information that gives you a chance to update your views. That's what Bayesian reasoning is about. Now to explain how people go wrong in this or they don't, how do people who don't think like Bayesians think? Let me explain that. Imagine that you're walking around on a sort of a campus in the American University and you meet this guy called Tom. You chat with him for a few minutes and you notice that he's a very shy kind of a guy. He's not making eye contact very often and he's sort of mumbling. Is Tom more likely to be in a math PhD program or in the business school? It has to be one or the other. Most people say math. What they don't ask is, how many math students are there compared to business school students? And the way to figure that out is with the help of this beautiful tutorial, short tutorial about Bayes theorem. Just watch this and you know, you would have understood how this thing works. A while back, I made a video about Bayes rule and explained how it had been influential in my thinking. I didn't really, however, explain how Bayes' rule works um, or what it is, so I'm going to do that today. I'll start with a puzzle. Imagine that you're walking across the campus of some large American university and you meet a guy, let's call him Tom. You chat with Tom for a few minutes and you notice that Tom is shy. He's not really making eye contact very often, he's um, mumbling. And my question for you is, if you had to guess, would you guess that Tom is more likely to be in a math PhD program or in the business school? Let's assume it has to be one or the other. So I don't know what you guessed, but uh, I've taught a class on Bayes' rule a bunch of times, so I can tell you what most people guess, and that is that Tom is more likely to be a math PhD student. Um, the reasoning is that shyness is just much more common in math PhDs than in business schools. And I think this is accurate based on my experience. There's an old joke that goes, how can you tell the extroverted mathematician? And the answer is, he's the one looking at your shoes instead of his shoes. Anyway, so I think that observation is accurate, but there's another piece of information that's relevant and that people tend to forget when answering this question, and that is, how many math PhDs are there relative to business school students? There's a lot fewer. Uh, the numbers will vary from school to school, but it's something on the order of 10 times as many business school students as math PhD students. So we have these two pieces of information uh, about there being many more business students than math students, and also about shyness being more common among math students than business students. And the question is, how do we combine these two pieces to get one overall estimate about Tom? This is where Bayes' rule comes in. 
So you can imagine that this divided rectangle represents the relative proportions of math to business students, very roughly speaking. Um, we'll put it at 1 to 10. And now looking just at math students, we can ask, how common is shyness? Um, I would very roughly guess that it's about 75% of math PhD students um, come off as shy. And now looking just at business school students, again, guessing roughly, I'd say about 15% of business school students come off as shy. So now we've represented both of those pieces of information in one diagram, and we want to know whether Tom is more likely to be in a math program or a business program. We don't know which one he's in, but we do know that he's shy, which means that he must be in one of those lavender rectangles, right? Because those represent the shy math and the shy business students. So to get a sense of the relative probabilities of him being in math versus business, we just have to compare the relative sizes of those lavender rectangles. Um, and it looks roughly like the lavender business rectangle is about twice as big as the lavender math rectangle. And you can see how the math shakes out. We just multiplied two linear ratios, the ratio of um, math to business students, which we put at 1 to 10, times the ratio of shyness in math versus shyness in business, which we put at 75 to 15. And multiplying those two linear ratios gives us a ratio of areas, which comes out to about 1 to 2. So roughly twice as likely for Tom to be in the business program, even though shyness is more common among math students. So this is the mechanics of Bayes' rule. This is how it works. So it's a very simple point that you look at an image and you're impressed about the stereotypical uh, conclusions that you get about that image, you know, shy and, you know, a uh, student out there. And you assume that he must be a PhD student, but you forgot that uh, there are so few PhD students in maths as compared to business school students in a large American university. And when you do it formally, you find out is he's much more likely, even if shyness is much more common in maths PhD students, it's much more likely that he is a business school student than a math student. So the prior odds were overwhelmingly in favor of business school and the way it works out is beautifully explained by another guy and here's a very important point I'm making here when you are making judgments about information that is coming in remember the equation that I showed you here there is you're trying to arrive at a posterior odds which is basically what, what how your views are changing about a situation what your views were when you started what is the new information that came and how did that affect your views? The new views came in. But that's only one iteration. In the world of investing or in the world of daily you know, decision making, we don't just stop when we get one piece of information. We keep getting more and more pieces of information, which means that when you do this iteration, the next time, then the posterior odds of the first iteration will become the prior odds of the previous iteration, of, of the next iteration. The posterior odds of the pre previous iteration will become the prior odds of the next iteration. Well, how does it work out? Well, this is a beautiful example that Nate Silver writes in his book and he talks about the 9-11 attacks. I'm not going to play the math. I want to show you that imagine that the first plane has hit the towers, 9-11, right? And you, you want to estimate what is the probability it was a terrorist attack. It could be an accident. Initial estimate of how, how likely is it that terrorists would crash the plane into Manhattan skyscraper? It was very small. Zero point, you're starting with 0 0.005 because you have base rates. You're looking at prior information. How often do uh, planes go into buildings? Very, very small chance. Okay. And therefore, when you work out the other variables, you find out that when it hits, the chance that it was likely to be a terrorist attack was 38%. Right. But then the second plane hit the tower. Then this 38%, which is the posterior odds, you start with prior odds, you have information, you plug it into the formula, you get the posterior odds. This is the probability that you think right now, before the second plane has hit, that it was a terrorist attack. That means there's a 62% chance that it was not a terrorist attack. But then the second plane hits, and you play the same numbers, but put this 38% on over there, on top, when the second piece of information comes, you find that the number has gone to 99.99%. This tells us that Bayesian thinking is extremely powerful 
for making quick changes in your views also it's not just about gradual slow changes of views that this business is uh, losing its competitive advantage and i have to wait for like a lot of information to come to that conclusion when something terrible happens <laughs> or something superb happens in a very short period bayes bayesian reasoning allows you to make change your mind very very quickly the importance the point here is here is a framework that we were taught in school which teaches you if not mathematically but directionally you see the point that nate silver also makes in is that nobody does this exact calculation we just do it to make a point here bayesian thinkers think in a like a bayesian like bayes rule requires you to think directionally they know that the second piece of information is so vital that they don't actually do the numbers to come to the conclusion that now i'm almost certain that given that i now know that the two planes have hit the towers that is much more likely to be a is gone from 38% to 99.9% the same kind of thinking could happen in impairment of the quality of a business a governance issue or the award of uh, a patent to a important patent to a company i mean it could be good news or bad news that's not the point here the point is how do you factor in new information in all your life in any business that you work in you will be required to do this how do i factor in new information to think about my views my prior views do my prior views need to be updated in light of new information if so how quickly and by how much isn't that an important skill to acquire and if you acquire it and others don't have it and if you're competing with those people doesn't that give you an edge they taught you this in school but they didn't tell you the power of this thing and how you can use it and there are plenty of books and materials which i'm you know just showing you some of them which tell you how to do this right how to think about these things and get that edge so there are many benefits one is that you can update your beliefs bayesian thinking helps you update your beliefs the smartest people in the world that i follow are bayesian they don't fixate in views they live in world where there are shades of gray they may have a view like uh sherlock holmes he said do you have a theory he said yes a tentative one and now i'm willing to entertain other theories and maybe this theory will be abandoned because it just doesn't make any sense anymore it's been contradicted it's been falsified and a new theory has come up do you think this fellow is a is a great manager yes i do think so but now he's done something which is completely contrary to what makes a good manager therefore i must immediately change my view about what i thought then and uh, what i said about it to whoever and therefore act accordingly otherwise i will lose money sometimes you have to change mind quickly sometimes it is gradual what you don't want to do is to give into confirmation bias that only look at information that makes me feel good about my prior conclusions you know the problem is we are very um fixated in our views we don't want to change our views very easily we call it status quo bias or even we looking at information we only pick up things that make us uh believe that we were right after all and the smartest people in the world they don't change facts they change minds they don't care if you appear fickle minded it was right then it is wrong now and i keep telling this to my wife and i tell her about that i'm moving from this diet to that diet and this one now she just won't listen so some low carbs and give up sugar and give up this and give up that you know she says look at the outcome and nothing changes people who were right a lot of the time but people who often change their minds he doesn't think consistency of thought is a particularly positive trait it's perfectly healthy encourage and even to have a idea tomorrow that is contradicted your idea so you're challenging your ideas you're disconfirming your ideas you're actively seeking ways that will destroy your most cherished notions that's what a great thinkers are like that's what einstein was like that was um that's how uh, 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 um um charles darwin darwin was like the second is it frees you from insensitivity to base rate this is a technical term but basically it means that you looked at the shy guy you looked at the guy i described him to be a shy and you you found the story very compelling shy guy math you know go together so he has to be a math guy or if i show you this guy who is an old guy 99 years old and he he smoking a cigarette that makes you 
gives the impression that smoking can't be all that harmful. You see, this is just a data point. We are not asking how many 99 year olds happen to be smokers and how many 99 year olds happen to be non-smokers. There will be many many more 99 year old people who are non-smokers than smokers. You are only seeing this guy. So if you are looking at a non-representative information, you are giving into what we call as bias from representativeness heuristic. You think you get compelled by a story, you see a story and we see that in the markets all the time. That there is some compelling guy or a girl who comes along and she swindles you like anything. I will give you an example, I am using the word she for a reason because uh, there is a documentary which has come on Theranos. What do you dream for? That less people have to say goodbye too soon to people they love. I had heard about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. But you know, her story is so compelling. She was going to herald a revolution in medical treatment in this country. It was obviously such an incredible story. A woman creating this $9 billion company. Everyone worshipped the ground she walked on. She could do no wrong. She was the next Steve Jobs. The idea with the Edison was to stick the lab inside the box. She wanted Edison devices in every home in America. This could be the apple of healthcare. You all are part of something that is going to change our world. What higher purpose is there? Elizabeth came to me and she described her idea. It's impossible, physically. Elizabeth was lying about the accuracy of the blood tests. It's all a show. She didn't want anybody to see what was going on in there. We don't need to explain ourselves to competitive companies. She aligned herself with very powerful men who succumbed to a certain charm. She was deceiving investors to the tune of $400 million. It comes back to fake it until you make it. There was definitely something going on behind the scenes. She had bulletproof glass on the windows. Anything they typed was watched. It was very scary. Like, what are they trying to hide? The mantra in Silicon Valley is move fast, break things. That's not the way you approach science that's going to be impacting people's lives. Quite frankly, people can die. It snowballed into this crazy situation. In a panic, I went and bought a burner phone. I called the Wall Street Journal. What is coming out of her mouth is not reality. She never thought she had any elements. She was going to conquer the world. This was real lunacy. Can you tell us a secret? I don't have many secrets. Um... People gave her tens of millions of dollars. Venture capital funds, philanthropists. And she was lying from the very beginning. The charisma of the person, the story, the board of directors she selected. It was all a sham. The whole thing was a sham. And you don't look at the baseline information. You don't go and check the how many, how likely is it that what she is doing with a small drop of blood, she will do 400 tests accurately. You don't exercise your judgment. You don't exercise your, um, your um, doubt because of the charisma. We get too compelled by stories that we see. We don't back up and see where they come from. You know, we get excited by IPOs without thinking that most people lose money in IPOs. We get carried out, carried away by putting money in very high P multiple stocks without thinking that what normally happens to people who buy high P multiple stocks or what normally happens to people who buy highly levered companies. We don't ask what is the stat what is the normal statistical outcome of doing this. We are so compelled by this situation that means we are always focusing on information specific to that situation not the prior odds this is what we call it insensitivity to base rates and bayesian reasoning forces you that yeah it's true that this airline company might be a really good one but have you thought about it what normally happens to airline companies around the world is one of the most highest mortality rate businesses out there in the world what's so special about this one maybe there are reasons maybe there is specific information about your favorite airline company that will overwhelm the odd but plug it into the numbers like we did and see what happens to the probabilities because sometimes the prior information is so, prior odds are so bad that even if this is so good it still will turn out to be a mediocre thing and that's what you need to do when you're thinking like a Bayesian that you never forget that you are operating in a very tough retail is another one you know one of the toughest industries in the world you know go to malls around the world you see how quickly they shut down even in, in India 
it's a very tough industry it's the highest one of the highest mortality rates now you like the retailer that you found one company that you found found you only focusing on that and doing research on that and the um, con calls and the growth and the presentations and the interaction with the management the story the charisma and all that without thinking about what normally happens to retail companies they don't make anything they're buying and selling it's a low entry barrier business anybody can copy uh and what happens when you know have some something like amazon coming in or costco coming in and own brands coming in uh so you have to think about those things these are real threats to the to the hypothesis that you have and you're not even aware that there is a threat because you are so much in love with that little company of yours that you're ignoring everything that is going into the prior information what you call as prior odds so it makes you more objective the third thing that we do and this is the last last couple of slides that it forces you to become more objective because it de removes you from that situation and talks to you about other similar situations that have occurred in the past and then de-anchors you it de-biases you it forces you to think about the world in a more objective manner let me show you another brief video by julia caleb who talks about it that when you encounter evidence which goes against your pet theory how should you behave this is exactly what bayesian thinking forces you to do that you have a theory it's a it's your and it's a pet theory and the reason it's a pet theory is because you have bet on it you put money on it and you have talked about it and you you know you gloat about it and it's made money for you and now you have new information that goes against your pet theory so how do you think about those things and if you train yourself to be a bayesian thinker which you were never taught because you were told the theorem but you never taught how powerful this kind of thinking and how it can save your money and your reputation and how it can make you a lot of money when you deal when you compete with people who don't think like bayesians well just watch this video one of the biggest paradigm shifts in my thinking and also for a lot of people i know has been learning about bayes rule It's a simple mathematical formula that basically tells you how you should think about evidence. In other words, when you learn new information about the world or you make some new observation about the world, um and that could be anything, a fact you read in a book or you wake up and you observe that it's sunny outside or you call your friend and she doesn't call you back, any new observation, how should that change what you believe is true about the world? And It's not like I go around plugging numbers into this formula all day. Um it's more like having my brain steeped in Bayes has just qualitatively changed the way that I think uh, on a daily basis. So, how has Bayes rule changed the way I think? Well, first of all, it's made me a lot more aware that my beliefs are grayscale. They're not black and white. I have some level of confidence in all of my beliefs between 0 and 100%. Um, I may not be consciously aware of it, but implicitly, I have some sort of rough confidence level in my belief that my friend likes me, or that it will rain tomorrow, etc. And it's not zero percent, and it's not a hundred percent. It's somewhere in between. And more importantly, I'm more aware that that level of confidence should fluctuate over time as I learn new things about the world, as I make new observations. Um, and I think that the default approach that I used to have and that most people have towards the world is you have your beliefs um you're confident in them and you pretty much stick to them until you're forced to change your beliefs if you see some evidence that absolutely can't be reconciled with them but implicitly the question you're asking yourself is can I reconcile what I'm seeing or what I've learned learned or heard can I reconcile that with what I believe to be true about the world so for example say i have a belief that i'm a good driver and say also that one day i get into a car accident um the question that i would implicitly ask myself um you know naively would be can i reconcile this observation that i got into a car accident with my belief that i'm a good driver sure i can um it was the other guy's fault so uh i don't have to change my belief that i'm a good driver um after seeing the evidence that i got into a car accident um but after sort of marinating in bayes rule for a while you don't stop at the question can i explain what i'm seeing while still keeping my beliefs the way they are you go one step further and and ask yourself the question is what i'm seeing is this evidence more consistent with my current beliefs 
or is it more consistent with some other theory? Um, in other words, is this evidence more likely under my theory, my belief, or is it more likely under another theory? So, you know, getting into a car accident, sure, it, it is possible it's, if you're a good driver, um, but it's a little bit less likely if you're a good driver than if you're not. So that doesn't mean that after I get into a car accident, I should conclude I'm definitely a bad driver. It just means I should be a little bit less confident that I'm a good driver if I've gotten into a car accident than if I haven't. I don't know if you got it or not, but like a very profound point that you made that you have a pet theory uh, and uh, you encounter something and uh, that evidence is the, the, the default position that most people have is that can I use that evidence and still stick to my beliefs? But what she says, what Bayes rule asks you to do is to can that evidence be more supportive of an alternate theory, not your pet theory? And if so, then you must change your belief. Maybe slightly, but directionally you should change your belief. So for example, if I believe that I am invested in a company which is run by a great entrepreneur and they have never done anything wrong by the minority shareholders, ever, till now. So to, to my knowledge, you know, based on my, uh, my uh, diligence that I've done on them for months. And I've invested my money in it and the business is fabulous and I love the valuation. It's on the management factor, something happened. Um, and that something that happened was that he appoints his wife on the board of directors and she has no qualification to be in that particular um, business. She has no real reason to be there. But he says that I'm not paying her anything. Okay, now I like this guy. I know this guy. I've known him for a long time. I'm not talking about something which is uh, a false story. This is a true story. But I'm not going to name the person. And um, he says, when you meet him, he says, well, you know, I needed somebody to be on the board and somebody was retiring and I had to put somebody who I trusted and I'm not going to pay her anything, so don't worry. So my fears seem to have been allayed. I don't change my views. I don't ask myself the important question that knowing what I now know that the guy has put his wife, would I have still loved the management? I don't ask that. I'm already invested. So I let it be. Then a second piece of information comes, maybe a, you know six months down the road, that he starts now giving her 1.5 crore salary on a business that makes only about 10 or 12 crore rupees a year. Now I'm forced to acknowledge that what he was telling me was a lie. It was just like, you know, an excuse right now, you, you know, first appoint her and then give her the money and take money out and all that. Now I'm confronted with an, another, you know, uh, a piece of evidence which literally, it's like the second plane going into the towers. And I have to sell and it doesn't matter what I paid for, it doesn't matter what I told my clients, it doesn't matter how much money I've lost by doing this because I'm asking myself from base zero, knowing what I now know that this guy has put his wife and now he's paying her, she doesn't deserve to be there, she has no qualifications to be there, would I have invested? If the answer is no, then why am I there? These are the kind of tough decisions that you have to make when you are in my domain all the time. But you see, in this case, as she said, that sometimes the evidence is so powerfully that it forces you to change your mind. You know, you can't reconcile it. You, there's no way you could reconcile it. But people try a lot to reconcile the new evidence, no matter how much it should change your views, because they don't want to change their views. They want, they're so fixated on their views, they just don't want to change their views. They'll explain, they'll find a reason. They, and the reason will look plausible to them and to a lot of people, and their plausibility is there. You're a good driver. You're a driver who had an accident. Yeah, driver, good drivers can also have accident. But how likely is it? How much more likely would it would be that accident happened to bad drivers than to good drivers? That question is not asked. So your judgment about how good you are in your driving skills should be that confidence, that probability that you have you're a good driver should go down a notch when you had an accident. And if it was a very serious accident and you were drunk or something, it should go down to basically you should, you know, not drive anymore or something like that. The point I'm making is that Bayesian reasoning forces you to use an equation which has been around for like more than I think 150, 200 years and was taught to you in school and nobody told you how important and practical utility is without actually doing the math. Nobody is asking you to do the math. In fact, don't do the math because if you do the math, you will 
you know put more biases in it but directionally be willing to change your mind in light of new information that goes against your favorite theories that's all that he's she's telling you over here after sort of marinating a base rule for a while you don't stop at the question can i explain what i'm seeing with while still keeping my beliefs the way they are you go one step further and ask yourself the question is what i am what i am seeing evidence that is more consistent with my current beliefs or more consistent with some other theory this happens to me all the time in my walk and is very uncomfortable but i welcome it that i have this pet theory and this new evidence is coming up and it's an evidence which supports a different theory if the, what is happening on the ground doesn't care about what i'm thinking in my head right so i had my own theory which was always wrong but now i am there is new evidence coming in which is much more supportive of a completely different theory and i never had it in my first place so i must be willing to abandon my pet theory and replace it with a new one we spoke about these seven ideas proof by contradiction inversion law of large numbers compound interest multiplication rule small probabilities and large consequences and bayesian reasoning you know worldly wisdom is very very simple it's very academic and you know you get all these lovely academic ideas that are taught to you in education modern education as i started by saying is great great in giving you the concepts you got to learn how to use them and you got to use them routinely that will make you a much better thinker thank you Okay, I'll um, answer your question. I have to restart my computer. It's a three. It's uh, I have a. Actually, I may mean, have it now. It's on my phone. Maybe it's there. No, it's not there. Um, so you know, people write to me about this question is asked to me a lot. So I have this automated thing on my computer, and I type the word B B O O K S B books. The moment I do it, expands into a list of books. So I'll just open it and tell you. In the meantime, you can ask me your question. Mm -hmm. So, activist investors force companies to kind of uh, focus on the near-term gains by buybacks and uh, dividends and all. Yeah. So, uh, but we see that they have made a lot of fortunes from the eighties. You have Goldman Sachs and China. Yeah. China. So but they destroy the companies, right? Yeah. So, uh, but how is it that their reputation doesn't get? Uh, well, it has got tarnished lately. A lot of activists are in have have not done so well, and they have failed in their ability. What? See. capitalism has got two elements in it one is a zero sumness that for me to benefit somebody else will lose and people will do that because greed makes you do that you don't care you will sell tobacco you will sell uh, sugar uh, you will uh, sell overpriced insurance you will get into all kind of shady things because there is money in there but there is the other side of capitalism which is the positive positive sum game where everybody benefits and you are participating in that now wealth creation is a positive sum game wealth expropriation is not a lot of what activist people do is because they know that the stock price will move up if they cut the r&d because the free cash flow will go up or if they uh, get the company to borrow money to give them a large dividend uh, basically they're making the business more fragile clearly they're doing that because but they won't be around you know they don't care because they have made their money and gone so if the market is inefficient and it keeps on boosting the price of the company because um, oh my god the battery is 5% so better do this um so there is a element of zero sumness in activism which which doesn't charm me at all but at the same time some activists do things that should be done because the company is run by bad uh, corporate governance uh, executives you know they don't care about so you replace them you throw them out and replace them and do the right thing for the company to maximize value for example getting rid of business division that should never been in into misallocation of capital fixing that you know that is also a problem right so i'm i'm not saying that i like activism or i hate activism but 
some activists get into zero sumness the short term behavior that you're talking about i think you're referring to that to be sure that happens and that doesn't charm me at all that doesn't mean they don't make money lots of people make money doesn't mean that i, I like the way they do it right so that's my answer to that but there is a another side to activism which i think is very important and it should be uh, encouraged which is that poorly run companies run by uh, people who really don't have your interests at heart or who don't know the principles of capital allocation or even running the businesses like charities and stuff like that uh, they need to be replaced and there are uh, there is a you know there are assets in the business which could be worth a lot more to somebody else next question yeah Which one? Uh, compound interest, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You said that the end was important, but and A is A is what you're trying to maximize, yeah. right? How do you get to A? How do you maximize A? One way is give in to near term greed yeah. and try to make a lot of money in the short term. Um, but uh, if those things uh, reduce N, you don't even know about it or you don't care. Yeah. Okay. N is important. So let me give you a concrete example of how this works. Maybe before I do that, I'll wait for you to actually ask the question. Go so ahead. So given that example you used was Amazon, right? Oh. This is a new fraud company, which is an e-platform company. Mm -hmm. And given the business model of e-platform companies, the bigger they grow and the more concent like the more they concentrate on this, they're increasing the to scale, right? Correct, because of network e economics. Yeah. yeah. And given that the valuations in India for these e-platform companies, do you think that's justified? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't do that work. But I do know that there is a plausible reason for valuations to be high for that space because um, network economics has a role to play and there are non-linear uh, increases in, uh, in profits if you, if you have a successful network. It depends on a lot of, it depends on two things. One, is the network going to become a very successful network? It's a platform where you're you know, getting um, uh, two sides. Um, uh, buyers and sellers to participate like eBay or whatever. Um, it has to be successful, that's one, and it has to remain successful. But the base rate, now let's talk about base rate. Do you know that Google, which is a network business, network plan, you know, it, it aggregates uh, advertisers and users on different directions, the world's most popular search engine, is the 21st search engine out there. There were 20 others out there which were there and were gone. Are you aware of a mall, which is a happening mall, let's say in NCR region, let's say Ansel Plaza, before Saket came in and before um, Gurgaon came in and before um, the malls in Basant Kunj came in, everybody wanted to go there because it's a happening place to go. So it's a network, right? It's a, it's a mall which connects shoppers with um, uh, you know, uh, retail uh, shops and restaurants and it's very happening and suddenly somebody comes up with a new mall in uh, in Gurgaon, uh, ambience or Saket or um, uh, Vasant Kunj and people leave. The thing about network economics is that it's all about people. People are very unpredictable. Here today, gone tomorrow. Before Facebook, there was a thing called MySpace. I mean, and before that, there was another. There was an Orkut. They are all gone. You know, at the time and at the time these things existed, people thought they're unpregnable fortresses. This is the problem that happens that people don't back up and think that what normally happens, you know, you're looking at success story and you're thinking that this is always going to happen, but Orkut was a success story. Blackberry was a success story. Remember Blackberry? I don't know if you guys are too young uh, and Blackberry's uh, went away, but uh, it was the most popular smartphone in the world. And there were very strong reasons why people will believe it will remain a very uh, popular um, product. Why? BBM, you know, Blackberry Messenger. Because it's a closed system and everybody is on Blackberry and it's very secure and it's a keyboard and you send a BBM on BBM, you bypass the SMS, you're not spending money on SMS. Well, WhatsApp kill, came and killed that, right? Completely destroyed that. And Apple came and destroyed Blackberry. And now somebody else will destroy Apple. The point I'm trying to make is that by focusing on something that is successful right now, you start believing that this is permanent, this is forever, this will last forever, you may be making a mistake. Unless you study history of business failures, you will not have, which is the point I make. If you want to have good knowledge of Bayesian reasoning, you need a sense of history. Because if you look at an airline company and it's very you know, profitable right now without thinking about what is the history of airline industry in the world, you know, 
I don't know if you know this, but Buffett talks about it a lot. If you draw the P&L account of airline companies from the beginning of the airline industry till date, it's still in the red. It's not made of money. It's not broken even yet. The whole industry is not broken even yet. And we have to, counting the, we have to count the people who drop out also, you know, the survivorship bias over there. So the ones which go broke go out of the statistics. But if you add up their losses and the profit, the industry has not broken even till date. It's been around for more than 100 years. It's that bad. But you won't know that unless you knew about the history of the airline industry. You're looking at your one. So you're looking at, you know, I don't know which company you have in mind. But it is a very risky space. And within the technology space, net, everybody knows the power of networks, successful networks. What they don't think deeply about, in my view, is one, very few networks become successful. Those that become successful have reasons to not remain successful because people are fickle. They jump. They jump around, you know, BBM sort of disappeared, malls go out of fashion, Facebook could go out of fashion today and people, my kids don't like to go to Facebook anymore because they say, why do I have to go to Facebook? Thankfully, the fellow has gone and hedged and bought Instagram and other stuff. But the fact is that if Instagram was a separate company, it would be a re real threat to Facebook today, right? So people, you, who would have thought that Facebook would lose its charm? People's... Um, it's like popularity, you know, it's like fashion, it's hit, but it's not like close fashion, which is like a very extremely fickle network economics in, in technology businesses are not exactly like close fashion in my view, but they are not very dissimilar either, well, but they're unpredictable and fickle. That doesn't matter. You see, you, you brought something, you brought up a point which is completely irrelevant. How much you made, how much you invested in it. Because remember, Economics 101, some costs are... Yeah, so less than 50% loss. It doesn't okay, matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So the only two things matter. Oh, no, you don't have to go back. You have to acknowledge you made a mistake and I've learned something and the money that I've lost is tuition fees. This is what I do. A lot of tuition fees I paid. You reframe it. At least you feel that I got some education out of it. What you don't do is I have to get back in. I have to make back because the damn thing doesn't know what you paid for it. It doesn't care about that. It's a mistake that you made when you bought it. Maybe. Maybe things went wrong after you bought it. But only thing that matters is two things. One, what is this thing worth compared to what it is selling at right now? And what else can I do with the money if I sell it? If you can sell it, if, for example, if you bought something for 100, it's gone to 30 for the right reasons, and there's something else that is available at 30, which is potentially worth 60, should you make the switch? Switch. All your friends will tell you to make the switch. You're going to say, no, until I go back to 100, I'm not going to sell. Because you are that number in your head. The number in the head of 100 is irrelevant. It is completely irrelevant, except if you think about taxes, which you shouldn't really think about most of the time. Um, it's completely irrelevant. So don't even think about that. All you have to ask is, did I make a mistake? You see, making, in fact, every day that you don't get out of that situation, you are perpetuating the mistake. One of the fundamental principles of good decision making is that making mistakes is okay, perpetuating them is not okay. So you're actually compounding a mistake every day. I mean, where is your phone? Call up the broker. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, it happens. No, don't think of the cost, don't think about getting back and I know the percentage, I'm down 50%, so I have to go back up 100% before I'm back to square one. Nobody cares about your square one, nobody is keeping score. You have to keep score about, am I becoming a better decision maker over time? That's the focus on the process of becoming a better decision. Part of it is to taking losses. Part of it is to learn and carry on and feel the pain. The pain is the tuition fees. And make sure that you want, make a note, this is how I screwed up, I'm not going to do it again. This is how much money I lost, this is the pain I'm facing, and you know, facing. And I've lost a lot of money over the years, and I've talked about it in many forums. The tuition fees I paid by getting into debt, and you know, getting into derivatives, and getting into bad governance companies, and so on and so on. I try not to make the same mistakes again, and some I have not made ever. But it's impossible to avoid making mistakes. But it's always a good idea to find new ones to make. You ask the first one, then I'm going to give him a chance. So, this is so what, what is your take on mutual funds? Like, because if you could be people investments than the stock market, but uh, you have to really, like, they're supposed to be long-term investments, like almost... Now, my answer to you is, for whom are you asking? 
if you are asking for my mother no, who, how, you get the point here you know, for whom is the question being asked is huh? like if i am talking about uh, for my boy you have money to invest yeah, I have invested in mutual funds. I want to. Okay, then you shouldn't. My take is you shouldn't give it to mutual funds. My take is even if you don't know how to do it yourself, you can afford to lose some money right now and learn and you know live to fight another day. You're not like an 80 year old woman who who doesn't know anything about mutual fund. Even if you don't know anything about investing, you should try to do it on your own. They take a lot of fees and they make a lot of money on the on the whole thing, and they don't. Um, I mean, you can do better than if you do it right, you can do better than them. So why not give it a shot and see how it goes? Because even if you don't, it doesn't work out. It's not all the money you have, right? And maybe you, because you'll be making a lot more money over the years. So if you can take a chance, you can take a risk on yourself at this age. Maybe if you were like 60 or 50 year old, maybe I would say don't do it. But um, I don't think you should give your money to the mutual fund. Yeah. So my question is regarding evaluating the mutual fund and the strategy has been consistently outperforming yeah it will mean reward that thing lasts forever if one thing has been working forever for a long long time it will stop working for a while even if it continues to work beyond uh, after a while it will become there is no strategy that is bulletproof throughout so like, uh, for example some of these quant strategies that yeah will they will be they, you see think about the point what is a quant strategy it's an exploitation of an inefficiency now there are quants are observing other quants because they are they can be seen their behavior can be monitored you know the computers are seeing what this fellow is doing right somebody knows out there some in NSDL knows you know your trading strategy are being logged on a computer somewhere somebody is watching you don't assume that you know I mean it's, you should always assume that you're being watched right it's a good uh, process to have uh, it will change the way you normally behave right and the same thing applies in investing you have to assume that it will it will not stay. What people do, they find a way of making money, and it's a lot of money, and they start believing that this is ordained. I'm the chosen one. This is, you know, I'm the master of the universe. It goes to your head, anything is permanent. The only thing that is permanent is impermanence. You, it won't stay, no matter what. How good it is, people say, oh, it's a secret thing. It won't stay. It will be competed away. It's the most competitive business in the world. If there's a lot of money being made, people will find a way to... Uh, to chip away at, at that uh, strategy. Yeah. So, uh, in the process of uh, looking out for new motive business you could possibly invest in, um, so I sometimes come across annual reports that seem really glossy and like hmm. I don't know how to read through them. And I'm also like reading a lot of these books that footnotes contain a lot of things you could read through them. So, I was wondering if you could give me a few examples. Sure. Look, look at Temptation things. Foods. Just Google Temptation Food Annual Reports and don't watch it in front of other students. <laughs> I showed him a class. So it's quite impressive. It's a fraudulent company, um, but um, they use uh, uh, vivid imagery uh, of the human anatomy to, <laughs> to seduce people to love the company and they gave money to the company and even the auditor's report had photos of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> So just Google Temptation Foods annual report. They are collector's items, and see what happened to that company. How much investigation? How much fraud? How many, which, which are the investors who gave money to that company, and, and when? That's true. But again, when I said that fraudulent companies use glossy reports to swindle investors, that does not mean that all glossy reports are run by fraudulent companies. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, so, yeah, some very successful companies do like to communicate to their shareholders that how well they are doing and they believe in um, treating their shareholders as their partners and they, this is the only time they have to communicate how well they are doing and they don't want to make a good impression. So they spend money in making a glossy report. I don't see anything wrong in that. But what you don't want to see is are you spending too much money and are you using too much of promotional behavior in that? We're talking about the stock will go up or the business is doing great and you're displaying... Um, overconfidence or promotional behavior. If you see that, then that's a run like anything in the opposite direction. MRSS was like that. If you check out their reports, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Babel speaks on the idea of having a circle of confidence. Now, for a few of us who are, say, just new investors, uh, it can be quite daunting looking at, say, just a random list of companies across industries or sectors. 
So what sectors would you say are easier for a beginner to grasp and pick up a, a, you know, some See, Firstly, it should look daunting. Come on, you're going to enter my industry, you know. <laughs> I don't want a lot of competitors in my industry. So I'm glad that it is daunting and I hope you get daunted. Uh, but um, uh, the idea circle of competence is a very, obviously, a elegant idea. Buffett uses that term a lot. But basically, it means that um, stick to what you know. But you know, you're saying, I don't know anything. So I don't think that's true. Because there are things that you're familiar with. Even if you are not in the world of investing, you're familiar with consumption or something. If you read Peter Lynch's book, uh, which is mentioned in the list that I send you, he talks about that. He said, go to the mall and find out who are the successful um, uh, retail companies, you know, which are the ones which have the highest number of people in them, footfalls are the highest, or restaurant, or, 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 or a supermarket, uh, you know, something like that, you know, because you are, you are in a B2C, B2C you can see because you are the C, you know, you can observe and see which is the most um, successful company, the most well-run company, the one which customers talk about a lot in your friend circle or whatever. So that will give you a heads up that I should do more work in it because it seems like a very successful company. So you're not living in a, in a gufa or something, right? You do consume things. So as a consumer or as people, as a person who interacts with other consumers on a daily basis, you would have knowledge. What is important to have is an investment frame of mind. So I, I explain this to students. Imagine you walk into a restaurant. Let's say it's Haldi Ram. You know, one of those Haldi Ram... Uh, shops now it's a restaurant where if you do the math in your head without really uh, margins are good in in food right we know that but the churn rate is high you know the customer will go in and the same table in a lunch time maybe they will do three three turns right because people come eat like they're out like within 45 minutes and maybe even less you go to a five star hotel what do you find a lot of capex a lot of gloss and spending and maybe a higher margin but they have a lot of cost also maybe the margin is not that high but the Turnover is very low. In one hour, they will have only maybe one lunch hour. Only one table will have one one bill, right? In in a in a haldi ram, you'll have many bills on the same table in the same lunch hour. So you'll find the turnover ratio, or rather the revenues per uh, dollar of fixed assets, will be very high over there. The capital turns will be very high. So the moment you walk into haldi ram, you're visualizing that. Um, what is the capital turns of this business as compared to another one? Without going into the numbers, this is better than that. You start doing those kind of thinking that this is better than the other one. The margin is better or it's better over there or why uh, and so on. Having that investment frame of mind early on is very helpful. My daughter, I did a blog once, once she said that, um, what did she say? Who should merge with who? Big Chill, Big chill should merge with... Um, the one uh, subway uh, for whatever reason she felt that you know I'm a customer I like Big Chill Big Chill is a very popular restaurant in Khan Market and maybe other places also and then there is the subway so she used like to you know like subway and she used to play Monopoly where you merge with your partners and join properties and all so she had that you know kind of mind that you know if these two merge then customers like me will not be conflicted you know we'll always go and give money to them it'll have more reasons to go to them like Nirula's used to be a company where could serve you know, non-veg and veg and North Indian and South Indian and Chole Bhature and, you know, fried fish or, you know, burgers or pizza. You know, it was a family restaurant and very successful at that. So, when you go into these kind of situations or places as a consumer, you start thinking about what is the attractiveness, what is the value proposition, what, why do the customers come here, why do they keep coming back, why would they, you know, not come back ever again because, you know, they're obnoxious or something. So, those kind of things really, really help you think about whether you want to work in those companies or not. Basically, you're trying to figure out what makes a business successful and what makes a business a failure. Keep thinking about those things. Thank you. Yeah. So, question, how, like, as we are your investor and uh, we don't really have contacts to go to the management, like, and uh -huh. meet them in person, so how do we judge a good management? Because if even has... Do you want a contact? Do you want to go, to go to meet them firstly? Or you're thinking, oh, I don't have money or I don't have shares and you know I won't be able to meet them. I know people who have met management because they had no shares but they wrote a mail or a letter um, and um, I have a friend who works for, used to work for Google and today he's uh, f heading the global equity uh, I think 20 billion dollars or something of a company that he was in admiration of and he wrote to the founder a report on, on that company. This is what I like about your company. 
and then long story short he ended up working joined straight from google as a software engineer to an a global equity head of a 20 billion what you trying to do is get somebody's attention span right people are busy and nobody likes to read and um so what you need to do is be able to impress somebody that i have done some work on your company i've learned something but i've got gaps this is what i've learned these are the gaps i want to know about your company this is what i admire about your company this is what i want to understand um you will not say that i know you're a screwed up company and you've failed and i want to come and learn how you failed that won't work they won't invite you for that but basically you're talking about a company that you admire or you want to do work on you found you have to write something that differentiates you from others your absence of investment in the company or net worth or a name or something or a big you know fund house or something is not required over and over again i've seen you you will see doors opening so like my question also like how do we judge a good manager I said first I asked you do you want to go and meet them to be able to do that you said I can't meet them so how do I judge I said well that's not true you can meet them so that was first part but imagine that you don't want to meet them okay so I know people who are good at that too they don't want to meet they get biased and stuff watch what they do not what they say so there's a track record there's a track record you know how have they done and again when you look at the track record you're not just looking at how they have done you look at how they behaved given the cards they were dealt with so if a industry is going through pain you are studying all the players now there is one player who doesn't suffer and everybody else is suffering so you want to know why it's all about curiosity you know you are asking you are looking for something exceptional and you know want to know why it is happening and then you have multiple theories that are explaining that maybe it was a fluke maybe it was a luck factor maybe there is some skill in it which may not last maybe there was a temporary shortage in the industry which he could take advantage of and others couldn't all of those could happen but you have to start with something that astonishes you which means benchmarking which is comparing the long term track record of a business with that of its peers in the industry on a global basis if they are global companies if they are indian local uh, businesses and locally that was one um the other is look at what they said and what they have done you know a lot of people say a lot of big things but they don't end up doing things because you know the point i made watch what they do not what they say are they consistent are they consistent outperformers are they candid are they honest so that's what you're trying to figure out are they good managers or not will depend upon how good you see in a textile company if you earn 16% return on capital you're you're a champion but if you are in the fmcg industry if you earn that kind of return people will say yeah what, what kind of a guy are you you know what you you can you, you earn like 60 70% uh, returns on capital over there it's all about the place where you are and the base rates if you are in a favorable industry where there is a monopoly or a duopoly or an oligopolistic structure then uh, then you would want to the success that you would define would be the best in class which is the highest returns on capital even though the average returns on capital may be 35% per annum because it's a you know cool uh, 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 industry structure if you're in a deeply competitive industry you're looking at a cost advantage that this guy makes a reasonable return on capital but everybody else is underwater that's not bad too because a lot of people don't want to look there and therefore that will be derated and you'll get a lower valuation and also on and so on. basically the skills of a management are a function of the how hard is their work so some businesses are easy you know like for example if you own a toll bridge you know it's a asset which has already been around and your job is to run it so you don't have to spend a lot of time money on maintaining it all sales are in cash there are no inventories you open the gate collect the money and close the gate that's the management skill that you need right now com- contrast that with making chemicals in in uh, competing with global chemical majors around the world the degrees of difficulty are very diff- different so you have to keep that factor in mind and there's those are just some things there are so many other things yeah i think i'm done if there's only maybe one last question otherwise we'll yeah one last so, question uh, you spoke about confirmation bias right yeah can you talk about your personal experience wherein you faced it and how you all the time so you know i'm trying to lose my weight and this is some of the confirmation but one thing i want to tell you when i teach the course i teach in in my uh courses i say i'm not trying to make you perfectly rational because it's not even desirable to be perfectly rational because then you become a boring mr spock there should be some foolishness left in you maybe a lot of foolishness out there 
So I'll tell you a personal example from my foolish personal behavior about confirmation bias and I'll also tell you about my professional work and why that is much more serious than this one. So I want to lose weight. So I'm trying to um, uh, check my weight in the morning. So I get onto the weighing scale and the weight is down by 500 grams which is uh, what I expected. I feel very good about it. Nice. And I get off the thing and I maybe eat more the other that day or something. Anyway, the next day I get onto it and I expect the weight to be down by 200 grams or 300 grams. They're actually up. So what do I do? I get off the machine and kick it a couple of more times and go back up again. Because it's not giving me the answer I want. If I get the answer I want, I stop. So there are two aspects to it. I'm just talking about the first aspect, the, the stopping rule. When do I stop searching? The moment I find the, the information that I like, which confirms to my belief that I'm a you know, healthy guy or I'm a weight loss pre or something, um, then I stop searching, I don't look for more information. But if I get what I don't want, the, the thing gives me uh, information that I don't like, I will, I will doubt it and I'll double check and triple check it. The other, on a, uh, and of course, uh, you see, you have views, you have gone on record, you have spoken things, you have brought some entrepreneurs to your class. It's happened to me. All of these things have happened to me. And you have talked beautifully about them. And um, you may be wrong about the person or you're wrong about the business. You encounter it much later. Um, and uh, the thing about having made a commitment to something is that when you're getting new information, uh, how do you process that information? Which ones do you pick? So there's a beautiful study called Biased Assimilation and Attitude Polarization. It's about capital punishment. So stand, in some universities, they divided the class into two groups. They first figured out, are you in favor of capital punishment or against? Some people were overwhelmingly in favor. Some people were overwhelmingly against. Um, they put these people in separate rooms and they asked them, how overwhelmingly in favor are you on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 means completely in favor of capital punishment. This person should be hanged or electrocuted because of murder. Um, versus uh, on a scale of zero, not at all. So people are either on sevens or eights, in, overwhelmingly in favor, or on twos or threes, not at all, because they were saying it's inhumane and there's no point killing somebody because they made a mistake or something. You can put them behind bars for life, but don't kill them and so on and so forth. Then what happened was that uh, these people were given studies, academic studies, peer-reviewed studies. That um, some of the studies said that capital punishment is really helpful in bringing down crime rates. So they gave examples of Saudi Arabia, the way they would behead you or something like that, and nobody breaks laws or something. In some cases, they said you could, uh, you know, there is a case for rehabilitation of people and they can be useful members of society. They made mistakes, they, they were put behind bars, but they have done good work since then, maybe done online tuitions or they were made furniture or whatever. Basically, they have some useful role in society, therefore we should not kill them. And then reasonable people, which everybody, most of people think they are, would have expected that the polarity will reduce. Sevens and eights will go to fours and five, and twos and threes will also come towards fours and fives. The exact opposite happened. The sevens and eights became nines and tens, and the twos and threes became zeros and ones. Why? Because they picked the study they liked. They discarded the study they didn't like. In fact, when they picked the study, they say, oh, I didn't know about the crime rates in Saudi Arabia. I knew I was right. Now I'm even more believe in the belief that my view was right after all. In fact, it should be even more intensified. That's why we call biased assimilation and attitude polarization. And there's one big lesson that comes from this, which is about extreme ideology. That some people have extreme ideologies. Could be religion, could be love for a nation, could be love for a certain kind of food, you know, whether you should eat non-veg or not eat non-veg, whether you should uh, be of this religion or that religion, whether nations matter more than overall societies, whether animal rights are important or not, whether environment is important or not. These are called ideologies. People have extreme ideologies and that's not a good thing. Uh, if, and again, I'm not talking about whether good ideologies, extreme ideologies are bad or good for society. Some people with extreme ideologies have done amazing things for society. In fact, some of the best things have happened because of extreme ideologues, like, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or somebody like that, or, you know, somebody who does something because he's a nutcase, he has beliefs, strong beliefs in something, and he's completely unreasonable and he has a way to create a movement. 
people are like that and they achieve a lot of things i'm not talking about that i'm talking about being more rational being more reasonable if you want to be more rational and reasonable you have to assume shades of gray and don't have extreme ideologies and which what that means is never ever get into a battle with somebody on twitter <laughs> basically practically that's what it means never ever do that because no matter what you think or you're trying to reason with that person that you're wrong about this thing if they believe something they believe it so strongly that no matter what you do is going to make any impact on that if they will pick up they will completely discard whatever reasoning that you give evidence and all they'll complete this what confirmation bias means they will do that and i had that experience when i was you know uh, before i learned about these things and i still do i would say i'm not completely cured but i do am aware <laughs> that am i giving into confirmation bias when i'm seeing something that conforms to my prior belief even though there is evidence that supports some other alternate theory so the question that still arises whether i give into or not i think i do it less today than i did maybe 4 or 5 years ago and even much less than 10 years ago but i'm nowhere completely cured and i don't, i don't think i ever will be i think it's very hard to do that with this i will end and uh, thank you for having me shreya and uh, all of you and enjoy the weekend and it's great to be here thank you, thank you.